Okay, Mr. Warden, you are good to go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this meeting. It's July 22nd, um, and we're meeting as a county council. Before I do the roll call, I want to show everybody a little prop. I hope everyone's enjoying the good weather, but this is what you'll find in my backyard. And I'm gathering that everyone's gardens are also doing well because we've had a good mixture of uh, sun and rain, right? And maybe the farmers are happy too. All right, so Madam Clerk, roll call, please. You're muted. Certainly, yes. Mr. Warden. <laughs> um, we have uh, all members in attendance with the exception currently of Councillor McQueen, uh, Councillor Body. A counselor so ever sends his regrets, but we do have Councillor Sampson attending on his behalf. So welcome Councillor Sampson, nice to see you. All right, um, we have the land acknowledgement. Let's give me a quick second here. So we acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality and culture of the Anishinaabek, the Six Nations of the Grand River, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat, Wyandot, Wyandotte peoples on whose traditional territories we gather and whose ancestors signed treaties with our ancestors. We recognize also the Métis and the Inuit whose ancestors shared this land and these waters. May we all as treaty people live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all of its diverse peoples. Am I the only one that struggles with the word Ancestors, ancestors. <laughs> it's weird the things we struggle with, huh? Okay, item number four, declaration of interest. Is there any declaration of interest from anyone? Pecuniary or otherwise, if one does arise during the course of the meeting, I would ask you to declare it at that time. Item number five is adoption of minutes, starting with 5A. Uh, and we're adopting minutes of uh, County Council and Committee of the Whole dated July 8, 2021. That's moved by Councillor Carlton and seconded by Councillor Clumpus. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I will call the question. Is there anyone opposed? And seeing none, that's carried. Thank you very much. Item 5B is the Board of Health minutes uh, dated May 28, 2021. It is uh, moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor O'Leary. I believe that Dr. Era is uh, with us. Maybe not yet. If that's the case, then perhaps Councillor Patterson, did you ha have anything to add? Uh, just two items, Mr. Warden. Uh, good morning. Good morning, County Council. Uh, this is from the May meeting minutes. Janice Jackson, Bruce County Warden and Mayor of South Bruce Peninsula was welcomed as a board member. Warden Jackson is filling a vacant Bruce County seat. And Alan Barfoot was elected vice chair. Mr. Barfoot fills the position as a Bruce County resident. And for reference, so everyone is aware, uh, the positions of board chair and vice chair are elected based on a rotation between Bruce County and Gray County. That's it, Mr. Warden, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Patterson. So Mr. Warden, we do have Dr. Era on the line as well. Excellent, Dr. Era, is there any- He has no audio. Sorry? Um, Dr. Sorry, Era. his, his chat, um, in the chat, sir, it's saying that he's in the meeting, but he doesn't have any audio. Dr. Era, I would recommend that you leave the meeting and quickly rejoin them. Maybe we will give a second for that because uh, we're we're moving next to the. Oh. What? Sorry. There he is. Good morning. Um, there we go. Good morning, Mr. Warden. I I was there. I was listening, but I didn't have audio. Right now, I do. No worries. Thank you. Good to see you, Dr. Era. Um, you know that we're on. We're dealing now with the Board of uh, Health minutes uh, dated May 28, 2021. Is there and and um, sorry in the. Executive Committee minutes, which are dated June 9th, 2021. Is there anything you wish to add uh, there? Just an update uh, uh, through you, Mr. Warden, update about the current situation and surge and, and the vaccine, if uh, that's appropriate from uh, the council to receive. Maybe just to keep things uh, clear, what we could do is if there's nothing to add to those minutes, we do have a COVID update uh, coming up next. Perhaps I'll get you to speak uh, to that. 
Uh, is there anything that anyone wants to add with respect to those two sets of minutes, uh, May 28th and June 9th? And if that is the case, then I will call the question. Anyone opposed? That is carried, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, Councillor McQueen. Um, and so we're on to item number six now. I should say Deputy Warden McQueen, my apologies. Uh, we're on to item number uh, six, the COVID update. Dr. Aaron. Thank you. If, uh, if I may share my screen, it would uh, make the uh, presentation that much easier. Uh, this is an epidemiology curve for the past uh, a few weeks uh, since uh, the end of May uh, when we had the first uh, Delta case. And uh, you can see early on we have uh, control enough to have the numbers less than five new cases per day, uh, which is quite manageable. And over the past three, four weeks, we've seen uh, different waves uh, we put out the fire and we see it starting again. So on average, our uh, daily no cases has been uh, 20 cases. Our robust uh, case and contact management, uh, and, and that's uh, throughout the past uh, year, has not changed. The only change is the hard finding last uh, week that we have 99% of our cases Delta variant, very efficient in the way it transmits in, and uh, Usually for each case, we see two to three cases. That's the R naught, the reproductive rate for the regular uh, strains of uh, COVID. For the Delta, it is six to nine. So it is definitely a different challenge. And uh, last week, uh, looking at, uh, at the situation, whether we need to transfer to move to stage three or stay in stage two, the discussion uh, took place with different uh, stakeholders, with the ministry, with Public Health Ontario. Their experience from other areas in the province, Waterloo, one of that had the Delta variant, that this situation will stay with us for a period of time, could be around uh, 10 weeks. Uh, so we, we cannot bring it down to zero, but we can keep a lid on it, contain it, have enough control that's not going to 200 new cases per day. I'm not yet convinced this is the, the way it, uh, it's going to be for us. Uh, nevertheless, we just have to go through the uh, coming few days. Uh, the last three days, we've had uh, an average at around 12, which is encouraging that the situation that persisted for 10 weeks in other areas might not persist in Grey Bruce for 10 weeks. And, and again, that, that goes with the um, robust response and, and uh, um, trust from the public and all the variables that uh, kept us safe uh, for the past year. I do believe there could be a different scenario in Grippers. Looking closer at this, um, at, at this wave, you would see a few um, a trends. Private gathering parties at this point uh, has been the, one of the two main drivers for, for these cases. Uh, the transient low uh, economic status is definitely something that our society will have to look closer at after the pandemic to, to be because of the, the disadvantage, the challenge, the challenges that, uh, that uh, this group uh, has had uh, for, for a long time, but now it is uh, manifesting itself in high number of cases, high number of high risk contacts. And if I may, sorry, I'll open these files. Uh, at this point, we have enough cases where privacy is not an issue, and I can share with you internal social analysis of, uh, of the work we do, and, and it would definitely provide a good picture of uh, the uh, level of control we have. I've, sorry, I'm just looking at, um, at the different screen just to bring up the two screens together. Uh, the when I mentioned a few times that uh, uh, we have full control over the situation, it is control does not really mean we are going to bring it to zero. Um, we hope so, and I again I am optimistic we can. But the control comes from the fact that we follow up with all these cases within 24 hours. The fact that 
the 20 per day did not become 40 per day after three, four days. Uh, this is a, a rather complex graph of social analysis of the cases. And if I add another layer to it, the same layer, the lighter blue are the high risk contacts, the dark blue are the cases. And it's rather complex, but I can walk you through parts of it and all of it, um, more or less depending on how many questions there are gonna be after. This is uh, an event, a cluster related to low income government housing uh, where there is crowding, there are uh, transient community, uh, some substance use uh, with some of these individuals. And the other one, this one is the, uh, one of the uh, uh, parties in the past uh, 15 days. All these cases are between June 1st, uh, July 1st, July 15th. And these are the residents, all these cases are from Own Sound specifically, not uh, for Grey Bruce. Uh, and this party was not in Own Sound, nevertheless, the residents attended. And if you look at the general trend, these two are the main drivers. Uh, these events here are related to transient community, uh, um, uh, crowded housing. Uh, some of these we suspect are related to the party. It's just the link is not there without full disclosure, but uh, based on, on the uh, information we have, most of, of these cases that we've seen over the past few weeks are related to these two groups. Another trend that comes very clear, whenever the cases are attending regulated places, and there are around 12 of them on this uh, slide, hospitals, there was two exposures from two cases there. There were a few high risk, but no transmission. Those were closed. At, these are closed at this point. There was a restaurant exposure. There was a restaurant exposure. Again, no cases. And that repeats over and over where you would see that uh, there is enough evidence that the transmission within the regulated uh, workplaces, uh, regulated settings, organized events, organized uh, um, uh, celebration, uh, whether it is funeral or, or home or uh, you name it, it's there is no change in the risk of transmission. And that's the ground for saying, yes, we can move to stage three. Here, there is a, a, a really sad story where a transient person infected their child to um, a transient child um, visits their, their other parent and the parent has a partner, both of them carpool. So that's where there is another uh, potential risk of transmission between the two to a workplace, none in the workplace were either exposed and the one who was exposed, three of them, none of them converted to a case. So you would look further long-term care, uh, perfect control, nobody was exposed. Uh, there was up there, sorry, uh, doctor's office, again, perfect control. Uh, you look at a retail shop um, and other settings, there are 12 of them here. This is one of them as well. This is very telling. Child care, facility, daycare. One uh, case, many children exposed, no transmission. Uh, again, in Grey Bruce, at this point, there is one child care outbreak with two cases only. And that's the only uh, outbreak in uh, regulated uh, uh, settings that are not commercial. There is another one in, in a commercial setting, but again, it's a small one. So from, from this, there is a quite reassurance that we have control in Grey Bruce as, as a community, as a society, as businesses. And it is unfortunate that there, we have two groups of, um, uh, in our society, the disadvantaged people dealing with uh, many challenges um, and, and the younger people. And the approach is totally different. Uh, with the first group, we're providing support uh, from all partners and housing from the county. I, I want to thank the group, uh, the, the county and the teams in the county, whether it's EMS or, or housing or, or uh, the other teams. And for the other one, we uh, have issued a uh, few media releases to educate, but also to uh, send a warning. And uh, there will be charges coming uh, to people who did not comply with providing early information that could have protected some of these cases from being uh, cases early on. And if I can finish my update, uh, Mr. Warden, with the vaccine front, this is where we're at at uh, end of June. Uh, it's even a bit after June uh, 23rd. 
24% uh, of gray brews vaccinated two doses. Uh, within less than three weeks, we were at 60. Right now we're at 65% two doses, and that is significant. And I wanna thank everybody also who advocated and helped uh, uh, connect uh, with the, with the uh, provincial level to ensure we have supply of vaccine. And uh, this is the number of doses for um, first dose. 75% uh, of our population. Uh, that's the same comparison and just by age group. Um, our goal for the past three days were, or three weeks was to uh, get the uh, people who had their first dose uh, to get their second dose. On this graph, you would see the uh, light color, people who received one dose, dark color, two, two doses. So our efforts were under the curve under this curve to, to increase this color. And we have succeeded in, in achieving most people getting this dose. And we can, will continue to the end of July with mass immunization. And we'll be ramping up the targeted immunization. And that will be the space over the curve. Over here, those are the people that have not received either first or second dose. They have not received their first dose. Uh, younger people, and, and there's... Uh, between 12 and, and 40, we have different strategy, whether communication or access, that uh, I am confident we will be able to reach uh, the majority of the public uh, in August based on that target. And, and one final point, uh, our target was 75 for, uh, for the herd immunity or the theoretical herd immunity for COVID. That is, uh, that is very... Um, well done uh, as we go through July. Uh, and uh, the hard finding is the Delta variant, the herd immunity is 95, 90 to 95. Extremely difficult to achieve. Um, our discussion three weeks ago, that will be done by now. And we've done what we needed to do, but obviously the target changes with the, this uh, Delta variant. And, and uh, uh, going into the fall, if we don't have that high level uh, 85 plus um, percent, and that's that will go provincially as well. The chief medical officer of health office uh, predict a very uh, troubling uh, fall if we don't have that uh, level of vaccine, just because of the Delta variant is starting in the province and it is more or less a new pandemic. Um, I'll stop there, um, Mr. Warden, open to questions as always. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Aaron. I see Councillor Desai has got a question. Thank you, uh, Warden Hicks. I have a few questions. Um, and so some of them, I think, have been answered through the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Herr, for that presentation. Um, the one uh, question was why the case numbers are important at this point, because um, my understanding, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the whole point of the vaccine is, is not to prevent cases, to prevent the serious effects of the cases, uh, correct? It's, it's to prevent hospital, hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, through you, Mr. Warden, uh, both. There is enough evidence now that uh, uh, having the vaccine will reduce the risk of transmission as well. Okay. It does not bring it okay. to zero, but it reduces it. Okay, thank you. That answers that. Um, the, other the other question I had is you mentioned that uh, we're, we're continuing mass immunizations until the end of July. Um, what happens after that? Um, if someone wants to get um, inoculated, how do they how do they go about doing that? Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, there are two uh, main strategies. Um, one of them is the targeted uh, immunization strategy to send mobile clinics pop up drive through to different areas to ensure access, and that will be over the coming six weeks. Uh, simultaneously, but will extend beyond is the traditional vaccine system for sustainable uh, rollout through primary care, pharmacy, and public health clinics, similar to the flu shot, the annual flu vaccine. Okay, thank you. And so people will still be able to uh, get the vaccine if they so choose to after July, correct? Certainly. Okay. Um, uh, there's also, and, and uh, 
the communication from from the public health unit has been absolutely terrific. There has been personally, I'm I'm a statistics person. I love statistics. I've I've I shouldn't say enjoyed because that's that's not the right word. But I've appreciated the communication using the statistics to show why getting vaccinated is important. Um, the one thing that I felt that the communication was perhaps lacking on was um, the ability to change your appointment times. Um, initially, I was I was uh, supposed to get uh, vaccinated. My second dose is supposed to be tomorrow. Um, and I got it changed to the end of June instead. And that was a matter of two days between booking my appointment for July 23rd and then rebooking it for uh, the end of June. It was a matter of two days. So I think there is still some confusion around that change. And so if public health could maybe put that out in their communications as well, that you should check back again to see if there are earlier appointments, uh, just so that people who do have appointments booked down the road uh, do not um, uh, assume that that appointment will be will be kept because we're not doing mass immunizations uh, beyond July. So if public health could maybe put that into their communication stream as well, I would, I would really appreciate that. Um, and then the final question I had is, unfortunately, there has been more than the average vaccine hesitancy regarding the COVID vaccine. Um, there has part partly due to the um, uh, the misinformation surrounding the mRNA technology, and partly due to the lack of understanding on how the different the four three or four different types of vaccines that are available how they work. Um, how do we get to eighty five percent? Given the fact that there is increased vaccine hesitancy, is that an unrealistic goal? And if it is an unrealistic goal, then what is the future for? Um, not just Ontario, well, for Great Bruce, but also, you know, for, for society as a whole. Like, I just don't think it's feasible for us to continue living the way we do right now. So what happens if we don't get to 85%? And that'll be my last question. Thank you, uh, Warden Hicks, and thank you, Dr. Thank you, Mr. Warden, the two points you mentioned. The first one, I, I would... Uh, I appreciate some elaboration on it re related to the communication about early rebooking because that has been our targeted communication. We had uh, uh, daily radio um, messages that play every hour to ask people to book earlier. We sent uh, um, multiple media releases. Uh, we sent daily email to all people who booked their appointment in August um, October and uh, September and October. And we've been working actually with the ministry uh, through their call center to reach out to these individuals by phone, not just by email. There's an a daily email that goes, please book earlier. And, and this is the link. Uh, so maybe I'm misunderstanding the point, if you can elaborate on it, because I, I want to ensure that we uh, improve our communication if the need be. And fair enough. Thank you for that information. Um, so like I mentioned, I'd rebooked, so I haven't received any of that. I, I get most of the information, most of the Grey Bruce uh, Health Unit communications I do see is on social media. Um, so I, I can appreciate that I missed out on, on the emails and so on. So um, I will retract that, that comment on the communication. Um, so thank you very much for that, Dr. Hera. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and if you did not receive it, uh, Maybe after the, the meeting, I can connect. I, I am interested why our system failed to send uh, to reach. Oh, yeah. Because I, I rebooked, rebooked it for earlier. Oh, so I see. I, I rebooked it a long, long time ago, which is why I wouldn't have been part of the uh, system to receive that email. Thank so, you. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for that clarification. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. The, through you, Mr. Chair, This the final question was about... Uh, vaccine um, confidence and vaccine hesitancy. Uh, and and uh, it is not unexpected to see that people might be hesitant. Uh, it's worth laying the, the st stats about vaccines in general. You'd find anti-vaxxers, people who would refuse a vaccine, no way they would get close to a vaccine. They're less than 5%. They're actually two to 3% in many communities. They're just vocal on social media. And uh, the 60, 70% of the 
public would want the vaccine immediately. And what, that's what we have seen when we designed the mass immunization to capture this early group. And, and there is a group about 20 to 25 percent who uh, are, are not refusing the vaccine, but there could be, uh, there, there are usually multiple reasons uh, that, that would uh, relate themselves to two groups, access. And this is where the targeted immunization would help. Uh, some people have uh, no way of transportation or they cannot leave their work. So if we deploy units to the workplace, deploy units to um, Amish Mennonite community, we, we will see more uptake. And the other group, uh, vaccine hesitancy. Uh, there, is a, there is a field of study about that and there are multiple reasons for it, whether it's uh, uh, faith-based or, or belief or tradition or uh, lack of information. And we will work on all these fronts. There is enough material and study about the subject to, to ensure we can do everything we can um, there. Um, and and the, the, the warden actually used an analogy the other day that I've used since and, and has been very receptive. Uh, um, mass immunization is similar to losing weight. Uh, and uh, for a person to lose 40 pounds, it's effortless to lose 30 pounds. Then the last few pounds are going to be very troublesome to go through and, and uh, needs more perseverance. And similarly, in, in vaccines, this is a trend that we've seen before. If we don't reach the 90 percent uh, or the 95, definitely we're not going to reach because children under 12 are not cannot get the vaccine and anti-vaxxers are 2-3%. They add up, we cannot reach the 95. We most likely end up with a, an experience that will uh, that's taking place right now in the UK. They decided to lift their restriction at 85% um, of the population receiving one dose, 66, two doses. So that, that's a level that is we, we can probably achieve and exceed. And they lifted the restriction based on the fact that hospitalization and death uh, are not as high, uh, and the hospital system can handle that. And the fact that most of these are in people who are not vaccinated, so um, that that could be the experience if successful in the UK could be replicated here. Uh, other than that, we'll just have to uh, evaluate and and uh, um, change course based on the information and the situation in Ontario as we go. Thank you, Dr. Eric. Uh Thank you, Not thank you, Dr. Side. Aaron. Sorry, just the last last statement on, on one thing Dr. Aaron mentioned with regards to the Mennonite community. And I understand that you, you did have a successful pop-up clinic in Osprey and there is one plan for, for Flesheton as well. So I do appreciate those efforts um, that the public health unit has undertaken. Thank you very much for those responses and I apologize for taking up so much time. No worries. Uh, Councillor uh, Burley, I do see your hand. Um, is it related to something that was just said or shall I put you in the queue? It's a question concerning COVID. I would like to ask Dr. Ira. Okay, then I'll put you in the queue. Uh, Councillor Potter, you are next. Thank you, Ma Warden, and uh, good morning, Dr. Ira. Thank you. Uh, I wish uh, I could be as good at explaining that chart as you are because I think that's very educational for the public. Uh, and I hope that we can find some way or you can find some way to share that with the public so they can see what the effects are, because I think that that illustrates it very nicely. Uh, the, the thing I wanted to ask about, though, is we're seeing a resurgence in the U.S. and other places, of course, but uh, in the U.S. and we're expecting a four stage this fall. Um, how do we avoid that? And do you have any... Uh, any plans for uh, for programs, promotion, whatever, to try and uh, to try and avoid at least uh, having it become as bad as it looks like it might be uh, to the south of us. Through you, uh, with, yeah, and I'm I'm referring, of course, to the fact that a lot of people just are not getting vaccinated. The numbers aren't there in a lot of states, and and they're seeing a resurgence of cases, new cases. Through you, Mr. Chair, vaccines is our only way out of this situation, uh, no question. And, and uh, uh, all this information will be released to the public uh, in, in either a media um, conference or one-on-one -on -one with the 
media outlets. Um, we had to reach a certain level of number of cases to ensure that privacy is not going to be threatened when we release this information. And at this point, we are at that level. Um, so it, it will be public and will be shared with uh, partners and, and anybody who would benefit from that knowledge. I just think it's interesting now that we're seeing them use the phrase, the, the pandemic of the unvaccinated. Uh, Councillor Sampson, you are next. Thank you very much, uh, through you, Mr. Warden. Um, to Dr. Era, I want to thank him for uh, for your work and helping us with our pop-up clinic, because I think you're right, we've moved into the mode where access, I'm calling it convenience, is going to have to be the key priority in having the uh, vaccine available. We just need to make it convenient for people uh, to get that last, uh, you know, two, 10, 5%, whatever the number is of people who will take the vaccine, but either are finding it too difficult, even though we've made it reasonably easy for them to get it. Um, and the walk-in clinics that you've helped us organize here in the Blue Mountains have been very helpful in doing that. I think we appreciate that. Does the health department have then the uh, data on the postal codes where some of this vaccine gap may exist? I mean, every time you go and get your vaccine, you're asked for your health card so they know who got it your health card all have postal codes. So I'm wondering whether without identifying individuals, regions might be helpful for us to get a hold of is to understand where that vaccine gap is. And then so therefore where we would focus, uh, uh, you know, uh, clinic attention. And secondly, to what extent have the local physicians been asked to engage in this campaign? Um, I know the clinics here locally have been done through one or two of the physicians, but it doesn't seem to be me that all of the physicians in the area are as equally enthused about um, participating in the vaccine campaign as perhaps maybe they should be. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I will probably tackle the second question uh, earlier. Uh, if I, uh, sorry, I'm just uh, trying to share my screen. The, sorry, can I ask uh, if you're seeing two graphs or one graph on my screen? We're seeing two. Two. And now we're seeing one. Yeah. So this graph would show the um, vaccines that were distributed uh, based on, on mode of delivery. Mass immunization uh, did the bulk of the work, and, and that's the plan. Primary care and pharmacy have been boarded uh, since... Uh, uh, since uh, I would say we, we start working on it since um, January and February communication with uh, these partners. And as soon as the ministry opened the, go the door for uh, COVAX, which is a software that can be used uh, for, uh, for vaccine, uh, the door was opened for these partners. Uh, we, were, we added them to the, um, uh, to the task force for vaccine or not the task force. Sorry, that's not the... Um, not the right term, to, to the uh, uh, delivery methods. And uh, currently we have 35 pharmacies in Gribros, 12 family health teams. Not all family health teams are uh, providing vaccines and their engagement is different. Uh, I, would, I would look at, for example, the uh, Northern Peninsula. The family health team there is, is uh, doing the bulk of the work on their own. Uh, we're providing them with more resources, more supplies, just to uh, for equity purpose. Uh, so we're, we look at the distribution in Grey Bruce, and uh, we wanted to ensure areas where there are no hubs, there is another method of delivery. And we've connected with the municipalities early on, mapped out locations, community centers that family health teams or pharmacies can use. And some of uh, these partners have utilized that, some uh, of them vaccinated in their own clinics. Uh, the the uh, bottom line to that process is there there is delivery methods to cover all parts of Gribros, and uh, we always look at equity to ensure that there isn't uh, any municipality or group was left behind. The first part of the questions uh, about uh, postal code that is one way to to map out where the vaccines are and where they're not, but it is not the most practical and it's not necessary at this point. And I will explain why. Uh, people uh, have a postal code based on their 
uh, health card. Uh, however, they might be living somewhere else. We know that there are many visitors in our area. So uh, looking at the postal code can, can really bias the assessment uh, in, in many ways. We know that the uh, goal for mass immunization was to open it for everybody who wants it. Now with the targeted, we can go to municipalities based on the level of vaccine. So instead of looking at the people who are not vaccinated, we're looking at the people who are vaccinated. And if we look at municipalities that have not reached the 75%, that's where we're gonna be sending the mass, uh, the targeted uh, clinics. Uh, if we go further in time, in late August, I would expect that uh, all municipalities are over the 75 or over the 80. And, and at that time, uh, we, we, can, uh, we, we have started this already, communicating with the local municipal leaders. And, and uh, I'll, I'll mention this uh, um, recent experience with uh, um, uh, Mayor uh, McQueen. He already proactively mapped out the community that is, um, uh, does not have transportation or the people who want the vaccine but don't have access. Uh, so that, that uh, level of granularity in understanding the community would, is, is superior to what the postal code versus COVAX code can, can be cross-examined and to find out cer certain people are local or visitors or, or not. So in, in short, we have better techniques than that. Do we have those access to the postal code? No, we don't. And, and uh, for many reasons related to privacy, related to our system, having different uh, um, electronic medical records. Uh, so we don't have it. And I don't think the, the system in general in the province has it. Uh, do we need it at this point? No, we don't need it. And that's, that's uh, my, my assessment and very comfortable and confident of it. Let's go, Councillor Sampson. Excellent. Uh, next is Councillor McQueen or Deputy Warden McQueen. Well, thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, again, thank you, Dr. Dare, for everything you're doing. And I, I want to put this out. Uh, you just raised it. And I think for all us county councillors, um, look at your municipality. If you see there's a, a gap somewhere or you can try to uh, make a, a uh, an improvement on people getting vaccinated, reach out to the Great Bruce Health Services and, and Dr. Era because it does work. Uh, I will say that uh, our pop-up clinic last Monday was such a success. And I, I think you maybe have seen or heard this, but you couldn't wipe the smile off my face to see that the Mennonite community was lining up and getting vaccinated. And I tell you, that just made my day. And it just, uh, it, was, it was so great to see. But the thing is, if we make it available, uh, close to our community, to those areas, there's no reason. There's no reason. One guy said to me, he says, uh, I was scheduled to go to Barry. He says, I only live five minutes away. This is so great. So if we can target those spots where, you know, there's no excuse, we're there. And so again, uh, work with the, work with Dr. Aaron and Great Bruce Health Services, look at for those areas that you can reach out. And we're having a second one uh, in the Kimplex in Flesherton next Tuesday. So work with them because they're great, and it's just getting that number up so we can uh, all have a, a great fall and that type of thing. The last comment I will make is uh, I think that Mr. Warden, you, you make a good, uh, uh, interesting comment. The pandemic is those that aren't vaccinated. And, you know, I think as a few other have said, as their numbers people, well, it's like probably going to war in the you know, mid 17th century and you didn't put your armor on. The probability is probably much greater if you don't have that armor on than, than having it on. So, you know, I think probably is, I think what, I think one time Dr. Ayuda said 90% of the new cases are those that are unvaccinated. Those numbers don't lie. Those numbers are the telling tale. So I would think for those that are, it's their choice if they wish to get vaccinated. But you know what, if you're just looking at the numbers and, and seeing that stuff, that's got to speak for its volume itself. And I think as long as you keep communicating that part of where that where who are who are getting uh, sick and getting ill is from those that are unvaccinated. So that will speak for itself. So again, thank you for everything you do, Dr. Era. And staff. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Um, next is Councillor Burley. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, and again, Dr. Uh, thank you very much for you and your team for all you do. Uh, one thing I tend not to do is to listen to the COVID news media 
sources because it's just scary when you listen to it. But one thing caught my eye the other day. I wonder maybe if you could comment. I noticed that the cruise liners have banned anyone that got two different shots to attend on their cruises. I wondered, have you heard any comments about that? Through you, Mr. Chair, definitely this is something that uh, inter-jurisdiction issues is going to be addressed at, at the federal level, most likely. Where in, in Canada, uh, exchanging vaccine is, uh, is allowed in certain other jurisdictions, uh, it, it's not. So if people don't have two doses of Pfizer or two doses of Moderna, they will not be considered by that jurisdiction as fully immunized, although they have one Pfizer and one Moderna. Uh, it, it is, uh, uh, there, there is, from evidence point of view, definitely the, there is evidence of safety and efficacy of uh, mixing vaccines uh, from um, uh, jurisdiction or from regulation point of view of travel. Uh, there is definitely an issue that uh, that's, I had, has been identified. There could be uh, solutions for it down the road, whether to, to have another dose from one of these two vaccines to complete uh, the the uh, full vaccine based on both jurisdictions, but uh, at, at uh, you know at the level of managing a pandemic, I would encourage people to get the first vaccine they can. And uh, in our area, we have enough vaccine that we're providing both Moderna and Pfizer in every clinic that we deploy. Uh, that started uh, uh, a few days ago, and and that will ensure that people will have their choice as well. Uh, Nancy's recommendation is to have two doses of the same type, if, if possible, if not, to provide the different type. Thank you very much. Um, anything else, Councillor Burling? Good. Uh, next is Councillor Mackey. Thank you, Warden, and uh, good morning, County Council. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Ayer, for your uh, presentation. My question is uh, regarding the uh, ongoing debate around uh, vaccination uh, certificates or passports and uh, how or if they should be implemented. You know, based on a lot of the information you provided today, one would think that there's probably merit to that. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on, uh, you know, you know, on that. I believe the science uh, table uh, just yesterday or today is recommending that there may be some merit to some sort of uh, certification. So can you please comment on that? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, if I can go back to a month ago, we talked about this and my answer was different from and my answer today. My answer at that time was based on the 75 herd immunity. Uh, we, we have confidence and we've seen the application of it that we can reach the 75. So the protection for the whole community can happen uh, through the people who want the vaccine, and, and there will be no merit for, for a mandatory approach um, or, or incentive, this incentive approach through a passport. With the hard finding last week that uh, the Delta variant uh, is the prevalent here and it's going to be the prevalent in the province, and the Delta variant requires a level of over 90%, uh, it, it, there is definitely more merit to, to this. My understanding from discussion with the provincial level, uh, the passport approach is, is not uh, uh, desirable. Uh, there will be most likely local approaches uh, where there is uh, encouragement to employers to, to have policies. And that's the media release we sent yesterday, a uh, recommendation uh, from this office to employers in Gregorius to have policies encouraging people to have the vaccine. There could be different mechanisms to it, whether through the Ministry of Labor uh, or, or uh, through uh, the school system. Um, but my again, there is a merit for it at this point with the Delta variant. Uh, the discussions don't re reflect that this is a provincial direction. Let's go, Councillor Mackey. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Keaveney. You're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good morning, County Council, and thank you, Dr. Era. You just mentioned uh, um, persons with duo vaccines and, and potentially um, some difficulty with the traveling should they wish to do so. So I'm wondering if you anticipate there'll be some sort of uh, booster offered or some scenario where folks in that situation may be able to, uh, to get um, a second or third uh, dose of a particular vaccine to make themselves in a position where they uh, 
can be recognized as, as being then fully vaccinated? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, giving a booster vaccine uh, is, is useful in different scenarios for people who have low level of immunity or immunocompromised condition. It, it is warranted. It will be definitely uh, based on, on that need. For the general public, a booster at this point is not warranted. There are studies uh, un undertaken, being undertaken at this point in time as we speak to see when that uh, recommendation will happen, if it happens. And that will be based on uh, testing the immunity level in people who receive the two doses. And uh, as soon as uh, it decreases significantly to under a certain threshold, uh, th there will be a recommendation for a booster. Uh, we don't know this at this time. Uh, if I step back from the vaccines, you would, you would hear, uh, uh, or sorry, if you step back and look at the um, coronavirus as, as a family, the, the immunity usually lasts between one year to two, three, two, three years. So the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, uh, is not going to be different. Most likely it's going to be within that window. Uh, the effectiveness of these vaccines will not be determined unless we go through the course of clinical trial and studies that are being undertaken. So uh, yet to, to hear about that. And if I can finish that uh, point, Mr. Orden, with uh, a recent announcement from an official in World Health Organizations talking about mixing vaccines. And they were referencing... Uh, this phenomenon where people self-prescribe three and four doses. And, and that is not recommended. That's recommended against 100% uh, at this point. And if there is evidence down the road for need, it will be, it will be shared. Thank you very much. Okay, Madam Clerk, I do not see any other hands. And if that's the case, boy, we've had a very good uh, discussion. I wish everyone could actually uh, see this and, and hear these answers and Hear these questions. It's been very, very good and educational. Um, Councillor McQueen, you do have your hand up. I do want to pass a story that I heard just the other day on CBC Radio. And I think it was down in Maryland, in the United States, where this uh, woman was speaking about her husband, and uh, she got vaccinated, but her husband was too busy. He just was too busy. He was busy at work, busy at work. He didn't get to get vaccinated. And he came down with COVID-19 and the sad part, he passed on. And she's been an advocate to sort of speak to others to say, don't hesitate, get out there, there's no reason. And it just, it just was a story that sort of hit me. And I just thought, you know, it's, it's so true that, you know, if you can't take the time and, and, and it just, it just showed it a small example of how fast things can change in people's family and their lives. And, and she'll, she's, so she's very, forceful and, and, and very sad, but she is trying to spread that word to others that it needs to happen. And from her experience, don't, don't wait. So I just wanted to share that with everyone. Thank you very much for that, Deputy Warden. Dr. Era. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I, I really appreciate this last comment. Uh, and and um, again, I, I thanked uh, Mayor McQueen, but I can thank everybody around the table. We've been working with, with uh, different all municipalities on the vaccine. Mayor Alar has been a, a champion in, in the way he, he uh, uh, organizes things uh, proactively. And, and I can give examples all around the table. The, the uh, example that Mayor McQueen mentioned is really key. Um, vaccine protect, regrets don't. And, and we live with regrets for, for life usually if, if there are of this magnitude. And, and if we forget everything we talked about today, I do believe the next one would will, will cover it. We have 100,000 people in Great Bruce vaccinated two doses. And if each person talks to a younger person or to a person in their life that are not vaccinated, to encourage them to get the vaccine, to provide information, to encourage them to talk to a physician, to a pharmacist or to a dentist, to, to get the advice from the healthcare provider or to public health, I do believe we can achieve the 85% again effortlessly if, if all of us are ambassador to this uh, mission for the coming few weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ara. Good discussion. Um, thank you for your time, by the way, because I know just how busy you are. Appreciate it very much.
Okay, we're going to move on with our uh, agenda. Uh, turning to item number seven, good news and celebrations. Does anyone have anything there to present? It's not seeing any hands. Oh, Mary Lou. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I just wanted to introduce our two new staff members to County Council. Uh, the first is Sue Murray. Sue Murray uh, joined us on Monday as manager of accounting and budgets. Sue is a chartered professional accountant with senior level experience in municipal public sector accounting, as well as public accounting. And um, this is a position that you're going to see a lot of. Sue will be uh, an instrumental lead in uh, managing the budgets, presenting budgets, tenure capital, as well as financial updates. And so we're certainly happy to have Sue with us. Oh, can't see whether she's there. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. I'm very excited for this opportunity. I look forward to working with you. Welcome aboard, Sue. And the next, um, Catherine DeBrowa also joined us on Monday this week as a financial analyst. Uh, she comes to us from the Blue, town of the Blue Mountains where she was most recently a budget analyst. So she has a, a good uh, amount of municipal experience and uh, she's going to be a valuable member of our team as well. Again, yeah, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for County Council. Um, it's nice to see a few familiar faces um, and I look forward to working with all of you as well. Welcome, Catherine. Councillor Potter. I just wanted to uh, welcome both, and especially we're sad to lose Catherine, but uh, she's gone to a good place. So good luck, Catherine, and uh, we know you'll do great work for the county. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Okay, anyone else? If not, I have uh, to thank you that I want to relay and uh, it's kind of written out. So here I go. I want to say thank you to the organizations uh, going back to COVID again, of course, uh, who've been um, invaluable uh, in responding to the COVID uh, crisis uh, efforts. Um, and while great, great county paramedics, housing and social services staff have gone above and beyond during the pandemic to respond to crisis after crisis, there are many staff of our partner organizations who have been absolutely critical on the front lines of helping our vulnerable residents to get vaccines, to have shelter, food supplies, mental health and addiction support, and to isolate safely uh, when that is needed. They don't get the recognition that they deserve, and I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all of them, uh, especially since some of them are actually with us uh, this morning. Uh, so very quickly, and at the risk of uh, missing out some, and I apologize if we do, uh, the United Way of Ray Bruce, uh, uh, Francesca Dobbin, and uh, Tony McGregor, O'Share, I would like to acknowledge Colleen Trask from the Salvation Army, um, Alice uh, uh, Wannan from the YMCA Housing, Joan Chamney, and uh, from CMHA Gray Bruce, uh, Stephanie Burley, and Ashley Timmerman, from Victim Services, I'd like to acknowledge Zoe Zeta. And from Safe and Sound, Emily Wickens. Wickens, excuse me. From Grey Bruce Health Services, Amy Bowens, Dan Prudon, Naomi Vaughan, and Robin Nicola. Uh, from Bruce Gray Child and Family Services, we want to acknowledge Rebecca Rainsford. From Community Drug and Alcohol Strategy, Alison Govier, who's going to be with us in a few minutes. Uh, from the Gray Bruce Public Health uh, Unit, Dr. Uh, Rem Zayed and manager Ian Wright, um, and all of the frontline staff, of course, uh, as well as many, many other uh, agencies affiliated uh, with the Bruce Gray Poverty uh, Task Force, uh, who worked alongside to coordinate um, the response. Without your hard work and 24 seven commitment, uh, many would have faced much more hardship uh, than they did, and our efforts uh, to contain the spread would have failed. Uh, some of these organizations rely heavily on donations to keep them going, and I hope everyone will remember how important, how important uh, 
uh, they've been to us. Anyone else? Uh, Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I waited as long as I could. Uh, there's a rumor over this way in Owen Sound that the uh, longtime owner of the Meaford Dairy Queen has turned the reins over to a new owner, and I think that's worth the celebration. So, congratulations, Councillor Keevney. Indeed, yes. Congratulations, Councillor Keevney. And I have a, an ice cream cake in my freezer right now, actually. <laughs> my daughter just had her birthday. <laughs> okay, moving along then. Uh, if there's no other uh, good news and celebrations, I'm gonna move to adjournment. It's moved by Councillor Desai and seconded by Councillor Patterson that we adjourn. I'm assuming no one is opposed to that. And so I will say that that's carried. Thank you very much. I'll take a second to switch gears. Lost. <clears throat> Does anyone need a quick break? We've been sitting for an hour. I know that we do have, um, yeah, I'm seeing a few nods. So why don't we take, uh, let, can we say even five minutes is now 1027. Can we come back at uh, 1035? And to our guests, would that be okay with you folks? Uh, just put a thumbs up if you would. <laughs> Thank you very much. We really appreciate that. So we'll, we'll uh, reconvene at 1035 sharp.
Okay, let's go back. Looking to you, Madam Clerk, to see if we have a quorum. Not quite. You do have quorum now, Mr. Warden. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. I'm going to say that we are now gathered as a committee of the whole. <clears throat> I call this meeting uh, to order. Uh, Council, is there any declaration of interest, pecuniary or otherwise? Seeing none, I would ask you to declare if one does arise during the course of this, uh, of this meeting. So uh, we're on to item number three, and we do have a delegation. And I'm really excited about this delegation, actually, because there's some uh, folks here who have excellent information to share. They've uh, shared some advanced materials as well, which I had a chance to look at. But to welcome, I would uh, uh, welcome Ian Reich, Public Health Manager, uh, Sexual Health and Harm Reduction with Gray Bruce Health Unit, uh, Clark McFarland, Chief Executive of Officer with CMHA, Gray Bruce Mental Health and Addiction Services, Alison Bogier, who's the coordinator of the Community and Drug and Alcohol uh, Strategy, and Sa Sandra McLay, McLay Winters, uh, who is uh, a member of the Peer Advisory uh, Committee. And uh, I would say right off to Sandra, uh, uh, I did read, and I know other counselors did too, the, the statements made by that uh, Peer Advisory <coughs> Committee, and they were very, very uh, impactful. Anyways, you folks are going to talk to us about uh, community alcohol and drug strategy and give us an update. I'll turn the floor over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Warden and members of council. Um, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, can everyone see my screen? I can, yes. And is it showing the presentation slide addressing the drug poisoning crisis? It is, yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so my name is Allison Govier. I'm the coordinator of the Community Drug and Alcohol Strategy. I'm joined by my colleagues who uh, Mr. Warden just introduced, and we're here as subject matter experts in the area of mental health and addiction, and we're here to discuss urgent actions that councils can take uh, to help curb an escalating health crisis that has been devastating communities across Ontario and right here in Gray County. Um, as you know, the opioid crisis has been in the headlines um, since about 2017, um, when deaths caused by the illicit drug supply skyrocketed. Um, but really, this predates the headlines by over two decades. A new study that just came out from the University of Waterloo shows that there's been almost a 600% increase in the number of opioid-related deaths across Canada since the year 2000. And last year alone, we lost uh, 2,426 Ontarios, uh, Ontarians just yeah, here in our province. So this is a 60% increase from the year before. And the trends here in Green Bruce, they mirror the trends provincially. Um, we lost 24 community members in Green Bruce last year, and that was a 60% increase over the year before. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to throw a bunch of statistics in front of you and we'll have some good engaged conversation during this presentation, but I am sharing these statistics just to show that this is an escalating um, health crisis that predates COVID, though the pandemic has certainly compounded the opioid crisis. And just um, drawing on um, Warden Hicks comments from earlier, and thank you very much for the recognition to the community partners who have been working um, to respond to the COVID outbreaks that um, this is really a, a community and health issue. This, this, is, this is something that is, it's important that we all work together. So I really appreciate that recognition. That's a perfect segue um, into our presentation. Um, we have seen locally um, and across the province how public health, community partners, and multi-levels of government can work together to address a complex health issue through the pandemic. Um, we've seen this first, firsthand here in Gray County over the last year and a half and more recently um, with some of the outbreaks in Owen Sound and Hanover. We will talk about in this presentation what we've learned 
um, from our response to those outbreaks. And specifically, we'll point to how bringing services to people, meeting them on their own turf in a coordinated way, listening and providing options, we can literally see people's health improve over a matter of days. So, so it was a real um, concrete learning for a lot of service providers in our community to be able to see those positive changes um, in such a short amount of time. Um, yeah, so I, I don't wanna speak for too long. I just wanna sort of introduce the members of our panel today and just mention that, you know, we don't have a saving grace of a vaccine for this crisis, um, but we do have the life raft of collective action. And that's why we're here today. We're looking to work with all levels of government and to collaborate on a multi-sector, multi-level response that capitalizes on the momentum um, built during the COVID response. Um, I'd also like to invite Barb Fady and Kevin McNabb to share their comments um, throughout our presentation and afterwards in the Q&A as they've been um, deeply involved in the recent response uh, to the COVID outbreaks and pop-up clinics to get people vaccinated and have been true and long-standing champions of harm reduction and supporting people with addiction in our community. So I'd just like to open the presentation by introducing Sandra McClay Winters. Um, as Warden Hicks mentioned, Sandra is a member of the um, Community Drug and Alcohol Strategies Peer Advisory Committee. Um, this is a committee of 12 people who have lived experience either personally or with their families um, related to addiction and substance use disorder. Um, this committee is resourced by the Community Drug and Alcohol Strategy and um, since its inception in December 2020 has met with seven different local agencies to provide insight and consultation on um, programs and services that affect people with addiction. So I'm going to hand it over um, to Sandra. Hmm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not hearing Sandra. Maybe she may need to call in. I can see Sandra, but I can't hear her. Perhaps if uh, Sandra can hear us, um, I know that somebody else had a similar problem earlier. If she wants to sign out and back in, it might correct the problem. We'll definitely make room for her. Okay. I wonder if um, we can, while Sandra is sorting out her sound, if perhaps we can move forward uh, in the presentation, and then as soon as we can hear Sandra, we'll 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 bring her back in. Good idea, Allison. All right, so I think that I will hand it over uh, to Ian Reich and I will move the slides forward. Um, Ian is going to um, sort of elaborate on some of the numbers that I've just shared um, and talk about uh, the local response here in Great Bruce. Go thank ahead, you very Ian. much, uh, Allison, and thank you everyone um, in Gray County uh, listening to our presentation. It, it is a critical um, topic to talk about, um, as we all know, and as Allison uh, did share. Um, since COVID, we have actually seen an increase of opioid-related deaths. Now, that is not to say that the COVID pandemic has caused the opioid epidemic. Um, however, what it has done is draw attention to in inequities within our system uh, and tells a story as to um, why certain individuals are struggling more uh, than others during this pandemic. So what this chart uh, basically shows is the red line there shows the state of emergency declaration in March of 2020 and a sharp, immediate sharp increase of opioid-related deaths. 
Now, those are attributed to a multitude of factors. There's not one cause, and COVID isn't the cause. Inequities are the cause. Um, so what we did see definitely was there was a decreased access to services, especially in that first wave of the pandemic when we didn't have the information that we currently do have. There was also a significant amount of stress related to the pandemic. And what we saw was an increase in substance use across the board from alcohol to cannabis and yes, to illicit drugs. But we have to reframe our thought about that. People use substances a lot of times to cope with challenges and stressors in society. Uh, so the choice of substance really doesn't matter. What matters is that more people ended up starting to use or using more often. And as with any increased use of any substance, negative effects will follow. The, the one thing that um, the opioid sub street supply um, has that's very different than our legal drug supply is the fact that it is extremely toxic. We're talking a hundred times more potent or more uh, toxic than uh, a Demerol, uh, for instance. Um, so fentanyl and carfentanyl are really the main components of street opioid supply at the moment. And they're mixed with a whole slew of other substances from methamphetamines, the benzodiazepines, and a lot of times you just don't know. So they are very toxic. Increased use, increased rate of fatalities, unfortunately. However, another important factor to this was social isolation. We were telling everyone, stay alone, don't, um, don't go out. Um, but one of the core principles of harm reduction is to ensure that if you are using uh, toxic drugs or using drugs for that matter, street drugs, to use in groups. And we were telling people not to for a long period of time. Um, so it's no illusion that uh, as a result, we did see an increase in uh, fatalities related to opioid drug use. There is good news here though. I think over the past few months, we have seen, and as uh, Warden Hicks and Allison have eloquently described here, we can combat this epidemic and we can do it together. We can't do it as one agency alone. We need to all be together to do this. Um, when we were able to wrap services around those most in need, we did not see an overdose occur. We didn't see fatalities occur. And what we saw was an increase in positive health outcomes in a very, very short period of time. This is very possible and we can do it. We just need to all do it together with the same amount of effort. If we can move to the next slide, I'll just uh, bring forward a bit more local context to our numbers as well. So as you can see here, there's no illusion to everyone. Allison mentioned the date of 2017. That's really when the opioid epidemic really took hold here in Ontario. And it's not necessarily because of increased drug use. Um, it's because the toxicity of substances in the streets have increased dramatically. 2019 saw one of the sharpest increases uh, throughout the province. Um, and that was highly related to the presence of carfentanil in, in drugs, which is a hundred times more uh, toxic than what fentanyl is. Um, so that compounded uh, moving into the year 2020 with a pandemic where we again did see uh, lots of recommendations to stay, um, stay alone, stay isolated, and the stress and isolation as a result did cause that increase in use. And as you can see, very unfortunate statistics that uh, Allison did share, 24 families did lose a loved one uh, last year related to um, and opioid poisoning um, due to street drug contamination. Um, so again, I don't wanna talk a lot about just statistics, but we've also seen a trend of our emergency room visits have obviously been on the rise as well as hospitalizations has been on a rise. Um, one trend we are seeing, however, that um, hospitalizations have remained fairly steady between 2019 and 2020. Uh, also, the calls in 2019 uh, from our EMS providers, we get notified automatically when they respond to a call related to a primary cause of uh, uh, opioid overdose. Um, those numbers have also been um, climbing. Uh, 2019 was a troubling year. In 2020, uh, we initially saw a decreased number of calls um, related to perhaps less people calling 911, less people asking for help. But another important thing to, to remember is lots of people were using alone and unable to call for help. Whereas prior to, they were perhaps using in groups and their friends were calling for help. So there's lots of potential reasons for this, but I just wanted to draw some, some main points uh, as to uh, perhaps why we, we did see an increase, uh, but the main, main cause 
is the toxicity of the street drug supply. And that topic we'll definitely revisit further on in the presentation. And right now, I'll just pass it over to Clark um, to uh, take over the next few slides. Okay. Thank you, Ian. So before you then, start, Clark, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Madam Clerk. Uh, how are we doing with Sandra? We are still having some technical difficulties. So if Clark could uh, yeah, Clark? proceed, <laughs> thank you. Certainly, thank you, Warren. Um, so when we um, factor in the cost of healthcare, lost productivity, criminal justice, uh, cost of the criminal justice system, and other direct costs, substance use has cost families, communities, and economies in Canada roughly $46 billion. Specific costs related to opioids uh, from 2015 to 17 in Canada were about $5.9 billion, or about 12.9% to total costs. Opioids uh, costs came about third to alcohol and tobacco. And this isn't surprising as alcohol and tobacco are more prevalently used than opioids. Um, while costs of substance use are, some are tangible, there are many intangible costs as well, uh, such as tra trauma, family dysfunction, and of course that uh, uh, human suffering. What is clear is that uh, we do need to address the, address the issue. And I think also when we look at these dollar figures, a small, compared to the costs, a small injection uh, into that uh, the service and addressing the issue would have uh, a huge a huge uh, benefit if we can reduce these costs. I can have the next slide, please. So substance use is a common complex phenomenon that exists on a continuum. So on the one end, we have uh, beneficial use, uh, positive health outcomes using, uh, using medication and, and prescribed uh, uh, drugs. On the uh, other extreme, we have chronic dependence and substance use disorder. I think it's important to point out that most Canadians use some sort of psychoactive substance, for example, alcohol, and they use that without any social stigma uh, and without any fear of poisoning related to an unregulated supply. Language, I think, is also really important. So you'll notice we do uh, uh, use the term substance use disorder, and I'd just like to take a moment to um, go over that definition with you. So substance use disorder is a diagnosable medical condition caused by repeated exposure to substances that changes brain biology, especially in areas related to motivation, cravings, and decision-making. It overrides survival instincts in favor of substance-seeking behaviors. So it is a medical condition. It is not a moral choice. People don't choose to be addicted. I think it's a really critical, um, really critical point as we as we look to address the issue. Uh, people are uh, move along the continuum uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, due to trauma or marginalization. Um, some people are more predisposed to um, substance use disorder, but it can also have many interwoven or even unknown causes. But nobody chooses. Uh, to become addicted or to, to, to acquire a substance use disorder. As, as Ian had indicated, they reach out uh, for uh, drugs as a coping mechanism. Um, one of the biggest barriers that individuals who live with substance use disorder face is stigma. And that stigma arises, I think, from a moralized view of, of addiction as a lifestyle choice. Um, and as a result, people who live with substance use disorder um, are more likely uh, to have difficulty acquiring jobs, um, maintaining jobs, uh, acquiring housing, and um, accessing healthcare. If I could have the next slide, please. So um, both mental health and substance use uh, issues can develop as a result of uh, common risk factors, uh, such as early childhood experiences um, of abuse or neglect and family history of addiction, mental illness, uh, social isolation, and, and chronic pain. Um, again, people turn to substance um, 
substances for as coping mechanisms. Um, one of the um, one of the the challenges as well is that we have uh, a very a disjointed system um, in um, in Ontario. We the mental health and addiction services are spread over about sixteen different ministries and funding bodies, and they're significantly underfunded relative to the federal um, physical healthcare system. Um, and the sectors are also siloed. So we, um, as um, people we serve, often have a challenge of trying to navigate through a very complex system um, in very trying times. So it is, um, it is difficult to acquire, um, acquire the, the help that is needed. So we do need to address that, uh, that coordination. And I think, you know, that our recent experience in Hanover really shows the power of that coordination and collaboration, where uh, the services on, uh, in the community came together. And as Allison had, had mentioned, um, came to the people who were in need of it, need of the service and um, engaged, identified the need and addressed that need in a coordinated and collaborative fashion uh, and had um, remarkable results. People's health um, status improved. They looked healthier. They were healthier. Um, police um, noted that their, their their calls were down because um, activity was down. And um, those who were living with a substance use um, disorder started feeling safe. They start. They didn't feel judged. Uh, and they began engaging in conversations around. Um, uh, service and uh, that are can really be life changing, not only for them, but for the community they live in. So um, just as a, a final note, um, one, one phrase that always stuck with me is from Gabriel Mate, who is a, a researcher, and he, with regard to addiction, he says, um, don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. And that's the source. So well, with, with that, I will turn it over to, uh, I think I see Sandra's back with us, so maybe through you, Mr. Warden, turn it over to Sandra. I think we're still having some audio issues with Sandra. Are we? Yes. Yes. Okay, let's keep moving on and uh, we'll see if we can fix that. <clears throat> Perfect, thank you everyone. Um, so I just want to use this slide um, just to ensure that everyone understands that this is a very complex issue and there's not one simple solution. Harm reduction is not the only answer. Mental health and addiction uh, treatment options are not the only answer. Community supports are not the only answer. They're all the answer. And we all have to work together to manage uh, the main causes of the opioid epidemic. And this chart doesn't include it, but I, I do want to draw on uh, Clark's um, statement that, um, and Gabor Mate for, for that matter, the majority, not all, but the majority of substance use related disorders have some sort of historical root in trauma or mental health conditions of some sort. Um, so that really is, when you look at the root cause, that's one of the main pieces we do have to tackle if we want to sort of fix this situation long term. But there's many short term solutions that we can look at. And I've included, uh, um, it, this isn't an, a, a, an exhaustive list, but this is a list that really, uh, they're the low hanging fruits. They're the big uh, ticket items that if we were to manage these, we could do a big dent within the opioid epidemic itself. And these uh, go all the way from overprescription of opioids, which recently over the, the recent years, we have definitely improved. However, Canada does still have one of the highest rates of opioid prescription rates compared to the rest of the world. Uh, especially when it comes to post-surgical treatment. Um, opioids are one of the first lines of, of pain management uh, within our system. However, the, the main cause of why people are dying is the toxic and illicit drug supply and some further opportunities that we need to, to really investigate. And we are looking for support for, for these options are, are things like safe consumption services. 
And for definitions, we did include sort of uh, our, all of these definitions um, in our package um, so that a full understanding is there. Um, also, uh, the availability of drug testing kits uh, for individuals that do use substances, as well as the offering of a safe supply program, which would be a clinically managed provision of pharmaceutical grade uh, medication that would replace the toxic street drug supply in individuals that are using. But another big piece of the puzzle is to ensure that people feel safe when asking and coming forward for help. And to do that, we need to get rid of stigma associated with drug use, but we also have to ensure that the people that are just um, uh, using with simple possession are understanding that they will not be um, labeled a criminal for their actions if it's related to um, their substance use disorder. And that's where decriminalization uh, can come into play to help the situation along. You can move on to the next slide, please. Um, one of the big ask is what can council do? And I, I just really, I, these are simple, simple asks, but they have a, a large impact potentially. So in, ensuring that what we've done um, to manage the outbreak uh, of COVID recently here in, in Gray and Bruce County for that matter, um, is that we all work together to an, extend and enhance harm reduction services available to everyone that requires it. Um, in, at all sectors, from social services to the health sector, everyone can offer some sort of harm reduction service, but also assessing the need for any internal harm reduction education and identifying uh, ways that you can incorporate harm reduction strategies into any current policies and practices as well. Perhaps the biggest bang for our buck, I'll say, if you can move forward to the next slide, please, uh, would be advocacy and support to not only our provincial, but also our federal leadership. Um, basically, local efforts are important, but are only one piece of what is needed to resolve this crisis. Council can also take action by letting other levels of government know that we need them to do their part as well. We are asking council to work with us to advocate to the provincial and federal governments to make our community safer. Uh, there was a resolution drafted by Moms uh, Stop the Harms uh, that already exists, and I believe it was included in the package as well. Um, just as an example of certain motions that have gone forward previously, uh, but we also need a national plan to address this opioid epidemic, not just a provincial, but a national uh, plan uh, that can include uh, decriminalization uh, because criminalization, again, does perpetuate stigma. Um, there's no such thing as a good, bad or a good drug or a bad drug. There's such thing as a dangerous drug and a not so dangerous drug but there's no good or bad. Um, they're all on the level playing field. They're all substances that alter our brain chemistry. They all do the exact same thing. It's just, we've labeled them legal and illegal. So decriminalization is an important piece. Perhaps another very important piece are the, the provision of safe supply initiatives. Uh, and we need to get rid of a lot of the red tape associated with that. To open some of these types of settings causes a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulties. Um, so just quickly on that point, safe supply again, it's not um, opening up a convenience store with every substance available for anyone to go through. Uh, this is a medically directed safe supply program where people go through intensive um, sort of, um, back and forth with their prescriber to ensure that they are using substances safely. Um, so that, those are the main asks. Our notes are a lot more detailed. I know we're, we're um, trying to speak about this rather quickly. So I, I am being fairly brief on, on all these points, uh, but lots of the, these points again are in the background documents that we did cover. And I really do hope that we do get to hear Sandra speak to close this presentation out because uh, she does have a, a very powerful story uh, for us as well. Thank you, Ian. I believe that they're trying to work on the technical issues and maybe Sandra will be able to call in <clears throat> so we can at least hear her. Is that it from everyone? That is the end of our presentation. Excellent. Then maybe what I can do is turn next to uh, council. I want to thank all of you for that uh, presentation. I'm, <clears throat> if we can change the screen, uh, perhaps I can see if anyone has questions. Council, does anyone have questions? Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Warden. Uh, 
It's been my uh, privilege to sit on the drug and alcohol strategy, I believe, for the last uh, seven years. And I am truly blown away by the collaboration and the, uh, the bang for the buck that, uh, that our county and Bruce County gets for, you know, really a small contribution. The way, uh, you know, the group is able to leverage those funds and uh, the hiring of Allison a couple of years or three years ago, maybe more, uh, it's certainly been instrumental in the uh, work going forward. Uh, certainly a shout out to, uh, to Barb Fetty from our own social services for the, uh, the work that Barb's done over the years as a co-chair. Uh, the work of, uh, you know, these various organizations, you know, in collaboration with one another has really had some positive impacts. And, uh, you know, as was pointed out, um, opiates and alcohol abuse within Gray and Bruce County continues to uh, cause a lot of devastation to many individuals and families. And, uh, the work of this group has certainly been uh, uh, a ways and means to alleviate some of that. So uh, just a, a thanks to uh, all the work that's been done. And uh, I hope that uh, our county continues to, uh, to fund this important initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Um, Madam CAO. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you. I wondered if any of our presenters could comment about um, the access to um, mental health and addiction support in Gray County. Um, is there a sense that you could provide to council with regard to um, capacity or wait times? I'll let Clark take this one. So we, um, we, we do have wait lists for, for our um, services. I can't uh, uh, give you the exact uh, uh, numbers offhand right now. Um, suffice to say that we, our, our services are under pressure. Having said that, I do think we do and we are taking a look at how we configure our services as well and how we can, um, if there's a way that we can uh, be more effective in the deployment of our services and, and how we can do that. Um, so uh, Overall, system-wide, um, mental health and addictions are underfunded. So we do we do require more funding. I think everybody everybody requires more funding, but it is true we do um, uh, are, we are underfunded as a sector. So. Follow up, if I may, Mr. Warden. Um, it, your funding comes to you from primarily from the Ministry of Health, Clark. Yes, that is um, that is our primary source uh, of funding. We also uh, do fundraise ourselves, and that is a growing source of revenue. And we do receive grants um, from uh, organizations such as the United Way. And we have uh, other ministry uh, fund us for very specific programs, such as the Attorney General and the Solicitor General. Um, so we have a, but, but the Ministry of Health through the Ontario Health now is our, our major funder. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Robinson, you're next. Mr. Warden, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I do see that Sandra has been able to call in on phone. Mm. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering, it's certainly up to you um, if you'd like to answer the questions or hear from uh, Sandra first. Yeah, with the permission of Council, perhaps we can turn uh, to Sandra's person, uh, portion of the presentation, and that may generate some questions as well, if that's okay with everyone. All right, Sandra, can you can hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Please go right ahead. I apologize, Warden Hicks and County Councillors. No worries. Good morning. I am here today to represent the Peer Advisory Committee, which is a compassionate, invested group of individuals and family members that use our lived experience to give honest feedback on addictions and mental health programs to service providers in Gray and Bruce Counties. Allison, are you able to put the word cloud up? Yes, I can do that. Thank you. The word cloud before you and the document entitled just Through the Lenses sec, of Life Ex Oh, sorry. Sandra, just hang one quick sec. Uh, we're trying to get that uh, document up. I'll tell you when it's up because you can't see it. Allison, is that good? Yeah, it should be on the screen now. Can you see it? Got through the lens of life experience, that yes. screen? Yeah. Okay. Sandra, you're good to go. Okay. The word cloud before you and the document entitled Through the Lenses of Life Experience appended to your council package 
is a collection of real and raw reflections provided by some members of our peer advisory committee describing what it is like to live with a substance use disorder. I hope that you have or will take the opportunity to truly consider these reflections. Addiction does not discriminate. It affects all walks of life, and the person suffering from this disorder is someone's mother, father, daughter, son, sister, brother, or friend. As I speak, I know that some of you are trying to decide if I am someone with a substance use disorder or a supporting family member. The fact is, it should not matter. What matters is it is time to eliminate the stigma surrounding substance use and champion evidence-based initiatives and programs locally for the betterment and recovery of those suffering from substance use disorder. Thank you, Councillor Warden. And You're very welcome, Sandra. Thank you for coming today. Uh, if we could change the screen, then I could see everyone uh, properly again, but I do know that Councillor Robinson was next. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr. Warden, and um, I very much appreciate uh, uh, this, this presentation. I'm looking on uh, page 12, at least that's, uh, that is what appears as page 12 on the electronic agenda before me. What can Council do? On item number two, assessing the need for internal harm reduction education and identifying opportunities to incorporate harm reduction into current policies and practices. And I'm wondering if our um, uh, delegation um, individuals could uh, speak on, uh, on that and uh, what that, uh, that means and the, the action that can be taken. And again, thank you very much for the presentation that we just had. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. I can take a first stab at this question then hand it over to my colleagues. Um, just to provide a concrete example, um, some municipalities across the province have um, provided internal training to all staff across all programs on harm reduction. Uh, so this would include, it would be similar to um, how, you know, some staff might have received CPR training or first aid training or, you know, any kind of training that would help manage a crisis that each um, each staff member would participate in training around how to identify an, op an overdose, how to respond to an overdose, um, you know, some basic training on how to use a naloxone kit. Um, and then with that training, sometimes there's uh, some background information about some of the information that Clark shared today around what is a substance use disorder? How can you identify a substance use disorder? How can you identify someone who might be in withdrawal? Um, and, and this would help everyone in the organization, frontline staff, managers, members of council, um, be able to respond to members of their community in a compassionate uh, way that may help save a life. So that would be one example of, of what um, council and uh, the county could do. Um, I do wanna give my uh, colleagues an, an opportunity to add to that. Um, if Ian, Sandra, or Clark, uh, have anything they'd like to add, as well as um, as well as Barb and, and go ahead. Oh, Sandra, you're echoing. I don't mind uh, jumping in quick as well. Um, I think uh, at the very very core, it's um, anti-stigma training. So education on what harm reduction is and what it is all about. A lot of times that training is all that's needed to open people's eyes and to be a lot more receptive to a lot of these other initiatives that we are talking about. Uh, a very, very simple example to look at is the provision of safe disposal of sharps within all municipalities. That is a, a, a policy that um, has more than just safe disposal options. What it does is allow for open dialogue with everyone from constituents service providers and users of substances as well. Um, asking the question, why are we having this here? And that question is an important question um, because really the, the idea is very similar to any other waste disposable. We want a safe place where we can dispose of waste, um, regardless of it being a sharps from someone that is diabetic or someone that is using substances. 
uh, all those are the exact same. Uh, but also um, placing naloxone kits and uh, like Allison said, training on naloxone kits with all AED machines is another policy that could potentially save a life. Someone uh, that suffers a cardiac arrest um, due to their um, prolonged um, diet perhaps, or their smoking habit um, or, or substance use disorder, sorry, um, is no different uh, than someone that is struggling with a substance use disorder that just so happens to be exposed to a toxic drug and needs life-saving procedure. Why not give uh, naloxone while we at the same same point in time, we'll give CPR and artificial respiration to someone else. So those are all just various examples of what we could potentially look at in terms of embedding harm reduction strategies and policies within all of our organizations. Yeah. And I, just, I just want to give Sandra a moment because I know she did try to speak earlier, but there was an echo. Um, I know that Sandra has a unique perspective on this, given her role um, in her professional and personal life. Sandra, are you able to jump in? Okay, let's go to Clark and then say, oh, I just see Sandra unmuted. Are you, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. I do have an interesting uh, take on this. Having been in social services for a number of years and then switching over to uh, paramedicine, I, uh, and then having the experience uh, with the peer advisory committee, I find that as professionals in various uh, agencies, it's really important to provide that uh, stigma training because sometimes we get so wrapped up in our daily activities that we can often forget where someone else is coming from. And often it can be our one kind word that may be the catalyst to their change for the next few days or weeks. Thank you, Sandra and, and Clark. Yeah, so um, I guess I also look at this, um, you can look at this as employers as well. Uh, and I go back to that image of the continuum uh, often when we're talking about addictions or substance use disorder, I think there's a tendency to break it down into them and us. So that those who live with a substance use disorder are different. Uh, that there's, again, it goes back to that stigma. There is an immoral choice and, and it's, uh, it's wrong. I think it's really important to look back at that continuum and there is no them and us. Everybody is equally um, uh, at risk. Uh, and uh, if people fall into crises in their life, um, they can reach for substances as a coping mechanism. So your employees can do the same thing as well. Uh, so it is a human condition and we need to start seeing it as that and addressing it as that. Uh, so to, um, to educate, I think just to, to, to educate people in that conceptual framework of this is a continuum. We all need to be uh, vigilant. I think, you know, alcohol is the most accepted uh, drug out there in society. And even with our children, we would teach them responsible drinking. Uh, and uh, that is that is just common practice, you know, and we watch for things we watch. We need to do that same thing with with all substances and we need to need to um, bring the same care and compassion uh, to it if people are in difficulty, not it's not a moral choice. Again, that's not why the addiction, but why the pain? What's going on? What help do you need? So. Thank you for that. Uh, Councilor Robinson, you're good. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Warden. And and um, not only was the uh, the wordle very um, um, very profound in its look in terms of if you really look at all the the words around it, but the uh, one kind word can uh, can be the catalyst to change. So some really profound words, and uh, I very much appreciate the response to item number two. What what we can do? Appreciate it. Thank you. Next is Councillor Keevan. 
Thank you, Mr. Warden. And I just wanted to add how very much I appreciate this uh, presentation. Um, I have operated a business with hundreds of employees over the years and seen some of these circumstances and have lost uh, two very close family members to addiction. So I have great appreciation for your work and, and certainly uh, encourage the partnerships that you have suggested and, and, the, and as much increased support as you can provide. And, and I just wondered if one of you would speak just a little bit more, it has been mentioned, but to the impact on our economy and to businesses with, uh, you know, with, with employees suffering with the, with addictions and perhaps any supports that are available to them and, uh, and to our workforce challenges overall, because in this area, you know, we have a crisis uh, you know, for workforce and we also know we have uh, this uh, situation with uh, uh, alcohol and drug abuse as a crisis. So I think there's a correlation uh, there and I just wanted to point to that. I'll, I'll um, hand this over to Clark um, to address the question around access to, to services for employees. Certainly, um, if, if as an employee you do have a, an EFAP program, they will, have, they will have some resources to draw on. And then there are local um, resources that you can reach out to. We have uh, addiction counseling. There are um, um, recovery homes as well, like uh, a residential treatment as well. Um, on a preventative basis, I guess there, again, it, it, it's it's that coping mechanism. So um, wellness programs, which which support employees to uh, manage stress and and um, cope, uh, educational sessions around that, I think are are important as well um, to uh, to set that that groundwork. Ian, did you have anything to add to that or can I move on? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think you can move on. I, I, I do think, I'll just add one little bit. Um, there's lots of, um, for folks that maybe aren't necessarily into that face-to-face, one-on-one type uh, intervention, EAP programs like Clark mentioned are wonderful if you have access to those within your workplace. Uh, but there is a, a few other virtual options that are available within the province of Ontario uh, to find help. Uh, sometimes just having a smartphone and having someone at the other end is really what we, we need to look for. So uh, there is something called the Big White Wall, which is a wonderful online peer support type network that is also supervised by uh, mental health professionals as well that is available um, for mild to moderate um, you know, mental health and, and substance use related issues. Uh, there's, there's a lot of those potential options. And I think uh, the biggest thing is making sure that whatever interventions we're looking at are, are what's actually needed for those individuals and not what we think they would need. Um, that's probably the biggest thing is understanding where the individual is at and ensuring the provision of what they require not what we uh, necessarily uh, think they require. Thank you, Councillor Keaveny, anything else? Um, no, thank you, Mr. Wharton. Just, just to jump in that um, the, the Big White Wall has been renamed um, uh, to uh, together, uh, uh, to, go, to go there all, together all, uh, formerly the Big White Wall. So there was a bit of, Bit of concern around the naming of that, so they've they've uh, they've cleaned that up. So. Okay, Councillor Potter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden, and uh, through you, uh, forgive me if this was already covered, but oddly enough, I got called away to take a call from one of my doctors while this was uh, being presented. Uh, do I've been prescribed opioid uh, for pain? in the past and took back to the pharmacy what I didn't use, but not everybody will do that, of course. Uh, but does this very often begin with someone who gets a prescription uh, as opposed to someone who just is on the street and gets lured into getting involved with this? Uh, do we know where it starts? And would that help us to in any way to uh, at least attack one part of the issue? Ian, I'll hand this one over to you. Sure. Yeah, I'll jump in and Clark, feel free to add anything from uh, more of the mental health perspective. Um, but really, I, I think we have to rewind even further on. Um, really, the root cause isn't necessarily the substance. The root cause is um, someone's um, 
trauma or mental health um, issues that uh, may be uh, ongoing at the time that they are given a substance. Um, as you described, um, you've been prescribed an opioid to manage physical pain. Opioids are also tremendous at numbing that mental and that traumatic pain that's up here in our head. Um, and when people make that association uh, between the numbing of the pain that they feel every single day. So imagine a headache that just will not go away regardless of what you do. And you take something and it makes it go away, even for a short period of time, you're going to be drawn to that and you're going to make that association. Um, so really it's the resolution of the trauma prior to the introduction of the substance that is so, so critical in managing these. Um, and the same goes for um, not just opioids, but alcohol for that matter. Some folks use alcohol in a very similar manner to sort of escape the pain that they feel on a regular basis. Um, and to get out of that, you don't just take away the alcohol and manage the um, addiction related to the chemical. You also have to resolve the mental health and the traumatic events that have been going on in that person's life to really see a positive impact in their life. And sometimes all it takes to resolve those is building trust in order for that person to share what has happened in their life. And they can resolve a lot of times those challenges through that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So um, it's not only the substance, but also the person's history that really plays a huge part in, in all of this. Thank you. I do not see any other hands. Uh, oh, Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I just wanted to, more of a comment. Um, I find with these presentations, I could listen to the speakers all day long because the, it's it's so interesting. Two of the speakers have said, you know, I don't want to give you stat after stat after stat. I want more statistics and I want, I, I don't think you talk enough about yourselves. So I've said this at the committee level before, you know, I, I hear all of the collaboration talk and everybody working together and, but nobody knows, or at least I don't know what, each person is doing on a daily basis. And just to give you an example, if, if Allison go over your head to meet 150 people in a week and it's Friday night at seven o'clock and she's only met 60 of them and she's had three emergencies set aside during that time, that's the kind of thing I want to know because I'd like to be able to tell my council that Yes, they're underfunded, and this is why. This is what they're doing. They've got this and this and this to do. It's the end of the week, and they're not even close. And I don't have a good enough understanding of what everybody is doing on a daily basis. And, and I don't ask that, suggesting that you're not doing anything. Everybody knows that you're overworked and underfunded. I get that. But I, I just want a better understanding. Um, when I hear Scott Mackey say, you know, because he's on that committee, he knows what you're doing out there every day. I want to be able to, I want to be that guy and I don't have that information. So I, I just, it's just a suggestion. I don't think you talk about yourselves, what you're doing on a daily basis enough. And I'd, I'd love more information if I could. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Councilor O'Leary. <clears throat> Any members of the Committee want to add anything to that? I, I guess I, I would love to uh, next perhaps hear from uh, Madam CAO and uh, perhaps uh, Barb Fady, uh, because what we're receiving here today really is what they call a call to action. Uh, and uh, there was a lot more in the written materials that, you know, time's limited, so you can't say absolutely everything. And so we do have a call to action. I would hate for us to have this nice presentation and, and you know, and then move along and say, okay, next. I would love to know uh, from either Madam CAO or, or Fady, uh, what do we plan to do? Um, what is the suggestion in terms of a next step? Because we are being asked to, uh, with this call to action, what do we do with that? Well, I'll start and I'll let Barb um, please add her comments. She is the one that's on the on the ground with this. I, I can't agree more with Councillor O'Leary about how council and 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 some of us as staff even are not as aware as we could be or should be um, about the scope and the breadth of the challenges that are happening out there in our communities. Um, as a primary, you know, rural Ontario has a huge, huge issue. And some of this is 
just starting to come to the surface. We see it in in um, in bits and pieces, but if I think if council was um, interested, and I hope you are, I I would like um, staff like Barb and like Kevin McNabb um, to continue the work that they have been doing um, with these folks and bring back a report um, that. A, will address some of the ongoing uh, communications opportunities that we might have, as well as um, looking to some, either some adjustments to our services or to um, some further initiatives that we might take. Um, so if we could have a, a resolution to that end, I think that would be something that staff would be um, very appreciative of. Thank you, Barb. Do you want to add anything to that? Good morning, Mr. Warden, County Council. I'm sorry, I was, um, I just lost connectivity for some reason. It's the day, I guess, um, but I'm back. And so I just want to um, acknowledge the, the uh, good work that we're all doing together. Um, it is really important uh, work. It always has been. I don't ever have, I've never believed that anybody wants to be uh, dealing with a substance use disorder and nor do they want to be poor. And so uh, currently on my caseload, we um, have um, many, many folks who are living both of those realities. And uh, I think that piece about the that Sandra speaks to about the stigma and the training we can provide to our uh, people that uh, are providing services in all of our offices and, and organizations is so very, very important. It's what we're calling a wicked problem. It's, it's uh, so big and overwhelming. It's very difficult to see a way out, but if we chip away at it and we continue to work at this, uh, we will find ways and means to move along that continuum. Very small changes can have a big impact with people that we're serving. Um, and the vaccine is, is exactly that. We're meeting people where they're at. That mobile crisis unit, we see that as an opportunity for us to take services uh, for harm reduction into communities that are not normally or can't uh, have easy access. And the, that bodes for uh, uh, equity and service delivery, things that we haven't always been able to do because people don't have transportation. Um, we also know that housing first model always works. You're not going to be able to stabilize someone unless they have a place to feel safe. That was evident of that small example that we've just um, experienced in Hanover as well with COVID management. So I just wanted to thank you all for um, uh, participating this morning, uh, especially our delegation. Um, and uh, we will continue this good work together. If I may, uh, Warden. Go ahead, Clark. I, I, I thank uh, Mr. Lear for that uh, for that comment, and and would be really interested in coming back to council and putting together a data picture. Um, at the you know for community um, agencies, data uh, has um, you know been a challenge, uh, and we are working uh, as a sector to improve our capacity to uh, collect, analyze, and and you know tell a story with data. Uh, in mental health and addictions, we have the development of the Center of Excellence uh, for uh, Mental Health and Addiction, who, who is, uh, you know, dedicated to that. So um, I'd be happy, you know, to sit down with Alice and look at how, what we can do, the best possible data we can gather. It will, it will not be perfect, but, um, but if what you're looking for is a data picture, we can start building that, uh, building that for you and, and, and continuing with that conversation. And just before we, uh, before we end, I would like to uh, thank the county for their participation and collaboration, certainly in the Hanover situation. Uh, uh, Kevin and EMS um, provided great leadership and coordination with that. It was uh, a key part to the success. So uh, thank you for that. So I want to thank all of you, Allison, Ian, Clark, Sandra. Uh, very powerful presentation. I I think what you're hearing from our CAO is that there will be a staff uh, follow up on this uh, call to action. Um, I know that I'm particularly, I said it at the beginning, moved uh, by the uh, words of your peer advisory uh, committee uh, members. Um, and I want to single one out actually, because <laughs> it really did touch me. Um, somebody who described herself as a, a mother of uh, three well-rounded children and has a husband who's a a uh, firefighter, and she writes, addicts are someone's daughter, son, mother, father, family member, and friend. They are people who are spiritually sick and need some love, guidance, and hope. Doesn't that say it all? 
So again, thank you folks. I really appreciate your time. Good Mr. Warden. Madam Clerk. Sorry, I did see Councillor Mackey's hand and then oh. we do have a resolution drafted okay. um, to, to direct staff once uh, all the questions are answered. Much appreciated. Councillor Mackey, I'm, I apologize, I did not see your hand. Thanks, Mr. Warden. No, uh, Heather just spoke. I was going to uh, move uh, the resolution that our uh, CAO uh, was going to uh, dictate to us. So uh, I'd be happy to move that. And I'm just wondering within that resolution, I believe uh, Barb and uh, Allison that uh, the budgetary crunch is not coming this year, but maybe is coming in the following year. And uh, maybe within the resolution, uh, you know, when council uh, it gets the, uh, the particular information back on the work that's being done, uh, you know, if a future budget could also be prepared, Barb, that uh, would help continue the work of the uh, drug and alcohol strategy. Thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Mackey. Uh, Madam uh, Clerk, if you could just sure. uh, read that for us. For sure. So that staff be directed to bring back a report on county and community stakeholder involvement uh, on substance abuse disorder and supports available. And uh, with regards to Councillor Mackey's comment, we do have a financial um, implication section contained in our staff report. So that's exactly where um, that information can be contained. Excellent. So that is moved by Councillor Mackey. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Robinson, seconds. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, then I will call the question. Is there anyone opposed to that motion? And seeing none, I'm going to say that that's carried unanimously. Thank you again, folks. Really good way to spend some time. Very important subject indeed. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, Council, we've been sitting for another hour. I'm going to suggest that we take, you know, a good 10, 15 minutes. Perhaps, uh, uh, Al, could we come back at uh, maybe nine minutes? I'm going to say 11.45 um, and continue. Would that be okay with everyone? We take a short break. All right, see you back here at 11.45.
Okay, are we back? Not quite quorum yet, sir. I do have a minute. <laughs> You do have quorum now, Mr. Warden. Excellent. I think I'm going to push along. I'm, um, I'm sort of timing things here. We're supposed to have another presentation at uh, uh, 1230. I'm hoping that we can take a break, uh, a proper break uh, prior to that. So let's see how we do. Um, uh, if we can get through um, the first item uh, 6A, uh, then perhaps at the end of that, we may take a break and then come back for uh, that second uh, delegation. Uh, so we are now dealing with item uh, uh, five, the consent uh, agenda. Council, is there anything that needs to be pulled from that list? Items A through E. I do not see any hands. And if that's the case, then I'm going to deal with the consent agenda. Agenda as it's presented, it's moved by Councillor Clumpus and seconded by Councillor O'Leary. Anyone opposed to approval of the consent agenda? say that that is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, Pat, you are now on deck. We're dealing with item 6A, uh, which is uh, amendments to our uh, bylaw regulating traffic and parking within uh, the county of uh, Gray. Um, it's moved by Councillor Desai and seconded by Councillor Patterson. Uh, Mr. Hoy, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, Heather, Ms. did you want- Sorry, Mr. Warden, yeah. I do see uh, Councillor Burley's hand. Oh, my apologies, Councillor Burley. Go right ahead. Sorry, uh, Mr. Warden. I just wondered, did you want to, does Pat want to entertain questions as he goes through this technical report, or does he want to wait until he's done? Pat? Uh, I was going to mention that. I, I think I'll go through them each individually, and I might even kind of rearrange it to save 17B till the end, because I have a feeling that'll have uh, the most questions. <laughs> Quite a smile oh, on his face. I think you <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> okay. Did you want me to share my screen, Heather, or, or did you... Uh... If you could, that would be great, Pat. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So this is our uh, traffic and parking bylaws, the warden said, our 4788-13. So what I was going to do, um, I, I will use mostly these figures for my reference uh, points here, but... Um, I just wanted to mention before I got started that um, 
this year we've really gotten more calls uh, about speeding than we've ever gotten before. So I think, you know, uh, a combination of um, people home, you know, during the pandemic, uh, more people are walking and cycling. Um, there's a lot of traffic coming up here, you know, from the, from the city as, as they always do. And, and I think the, um, some of those 80 areas or, or more built up areas, um, speeding is a, is a, is its own epidemic, I guess, but um, people just generally speed. And I think more people are realizing it as they're out and about on the roads. So we're currently on two uh, task forces dealing with stunt driving and speeding with MTO and, and a few other uh, areas, even some like Peel and those people are on it. So um, it's definitely something that all the public works folks see um, and we're trying to address. So within this report, you'll see that in generally, we try to stay within our policy. Um, there's some occasions that we would recommend something outside the policy. Um, typically, if, if reducing a speed, uh, et cetera, meets our policy, we will endorse it. So um, I'll start on um, uh, the chart. Oh, you just noticed the chart too. So there's that chart on page 21. It says whether it meets policy, yes or no, um, and whether it's recommended, yes or no. So there's a couple points where it doesn't meet the policy because if you went out there and did our, um, you know, our, our, um, our chart on whether or not it was the right speed, you would think it would have to be higher. Like this first one is an example uh, at Gray Road One shown on your screen here. So you'll see there's there's a, a 60 uh, kilometer an hour zone coming out of Wyerton that goes just past the airport entrance. And then there's a 60 zone uh, at Oxenden and around that Bruce Caves uh, entrance where there's quite a, a severe curve there. So it's just one of those things where it kind of zips up to 80 here in the middle. Um, it's a very short stretch. So even though if you went out and only did only did your evaluation as per our policy on that 80 kilometer hour zone, um, we just thought it would be kind of easier for everybody to just leave it at 60. It's almost too short to leave as just a small little bump up to an 80. Um, so we're recommending, you'll see uh, the orange, it's proposed 60, and it would match the area on each side of it up on grade one near Wyerton. So that's, that's our first one. I don't know if there's any questions on that. Everyone can just uh, point out to me if there's questions. Um, the second one is, uh, there's quite a bit of work around Kimberly, um, and we've been working with the community safety group. So, um, basically there isn't really, isn't a provision in our, um, or in the, or in the attack manual for step downs necessarily to a lower speed. So when, when we say that this doesn't meet, uh, um, policy, it's basically because, um, it goes 80, the red, you'll see the red coming into Kimberly from the south and the north, go 80 kilometers an hour posted all the way to town where it turns to 50. So we're recommending a step down to a 70. Um, that's not really within our policy because there isn't a lot out there necessarily. You know, um, it is generally a rural section, but it is kind of the approach to town, the Bruce Trails there. Um, so we're recommending that it steps down to a 70 after coming down the hill and going north as well. And then the community safety zone at the request of the safety committee in town, moving the community safety zones out um, up to Gray Road 30. Um, there's quite a few tourists in the area um, going through town and um, using the Bruce Trail. And uh, just kind of a heads up to everybody that, um, you know, this is a built up area, that type of thing. The one thing I wanted to mention um, the community safety group also wanted the town to be 40. Um, that is something that we, we probably won't be recommending 40 unless the municipality comes forward and says they want their urbans to be 40, for example. As we went through with, with Dundalk, um, we don't want to be the only 40 in town. You know, when, when uh, Dundalk had, or Southgate recommended all Dundalk streets be 40, then we're pretty accommodating to, um, you know, make the county road a 40. Not that the council couldn't decide whatever they wanted, but... Uh, that's just kind of the policy we go by. And the other thing to notice here is this little pink area down here in Gray Road 30, where people are parking basically to get access uh, to the trail here. Um, we've had a few complaints about it, mostly from residents that live right there. Um, and generally, generally during COVID, we've had a lot of complaints about people parking at these conservation areas. Now, planning has noticed we're going to try to build some parking areas and try to accommodate people more to get out there. Um, I, we try not to react too much to these because the, they're probably short term pain or, you know, people are doing more with COVID. Who knows when we get back to normal, what it'll be like. But in this area, it is a curve um, and it's, it's um, you know, quite a sharp curve and, and there's some entrances there. And we just thought not having people parked there would probably be better. 
Is there any questions about that? Okay, so on to grade road 30, the chart is on page 21 and the figure here is on page 46, as you can see. Um, basically, there's a four-way stop here in Hutchison's Corners where uh, grade road 30 turns. Um, there's some geometric uh, deficiencies there that we felt it should be really 50 in Hutchinson's Corners. So um, that was our first look at it to, to make this a 50 kind of where my cursor is going here. But then you get to the point where you're kind of out here. There's a couple subdivisions here. Um, again, we didn't want a real little short bump up to an 80. Um, we do get a lot of complaints in, you know, generally around Beaver Valley uh, about traffic. There's a lot of people walking and walking their dogs and hiking and doing those kind of things. So we just felt that we could carry 50 all the way through Hutchison's Corners, all the way to the top of Gray Road 30 and 32. Um, going south, you'd still be an existing 70 south on 32. And uh, if you're going towards Kimberly, you it's 60 down the hill, um, down Bowles Bluff Hill. So we're recommending a 50. It's a little extended in here. It'll feel slow to people, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, an 80 for a few hundred meters is, is kind of uncomfortable and strange too. So we, we thought a 50 was uh, um, suitable there. Um, the next, so this is on page 47. Uh, this is in Katy. Basically, there's a hill right here on the west end of town. Um, and we're just extending the 50 out pass at a resident request. And we looked at it and, and uh, they're correct there. We just paved this road recently a few weeks ago. So um, it makes sense for us to extend the 50 out, especially with Katy Market. Once it gets going, there's a lot of cars parked in here. And um, it makes sense for people to slow down coming over that hill. 17B, I'll go back to. This was Gray Road 18, uh, so we're on to page um, 49 of the, um, the figure and tw 22 in the chart. We just had a, a, a request from a resident who lives in these houses here, and we get them from time to time. A lot of these areas where uh, you're coming out of an urban and it's a 50 or something, and then it goes to, a, in this case, it goes to a, it's a 60, um, and it goes to an 80. Um, we get a pretty frequent request for someone to bring the 50 or the 60 in this case, just could you bring it by my house and then it can go to 80. And then the next guy wants it by his house. And then, so um, we kind of ran this through our policy and we just feel that this, this is where the 60 should stop and it goes to 80. Um, so we're, we're uh, recommending against that request of a resident. As, as 18 is one of our busiest roads as well. Uh, this is Greer 28 in Hanover, which is uh, page 22 on the chart and the photos on page 51. This was a request from the town for a bit of a step down. Um, Greer 28, which is kind of the Hanover bypass, we call it. Um, it was 80 all the way up to the stoplights here at the gas station at the north end of town. So uh, the town was just hoping we could lower it uh, to get down to a 60 and a 50, which we felt was very reasonable. So, so we're uh, recommending that change. Uh, Greer 113 in the town of Blue Mountains. Um, horizontally, like you, this is an 80 right now coming off Highway 26, and then it goes to a, a 50 as you get into Thornbury here. But um, this horizontally does not meet an 80 design. And uh, knowing that uh, this is a property owned by the town of Blue Mountains that is, you know, going to be developed, uh, you know, and um, and it just is such a short stretch. It doesn't meet the horizontal requirements of an 80 posted speed. Uh, we're recommending that um, this be a 60 zone. And it's, uh, I think it's only 900 meters. Um, just to slow people down coming into town. Not that, again, they'll drive it, they feel comfortable. Um, but we think in this case, uh, it's probably appropriate. And uh, this is actually, I'll go back to 17B and we'll focus on the speed before I go on to the other, um, the other schedules. So as I said, we try to stay within uh, policy um, and, uh, and on uh, page 26 of the report, you'll see that um, we go over the geometric criteria, our 10 sets of criteria um, to evaluate a road for the posted speed. So in this case, uh, the horizontal alignment and basically the way the policy is written is as uh, if there's a lot of risk in the speed being higher um, then you know we should lower the speed so this road uh, 
doesn't really have, it's very low on the risk scale. The horizontal alignment is perfectly straight. Our vertical alignment was rated as low because um, all the vertical curves are more than 10 kilometers an hour higher than the posted speed. Um, the stopping site distance uh, meets uh, standard. Uh, the lane width is low as the recommended was 3.25 and they are that. Uh, the only thing is the shoulder width. The shoulders aren't really wide here. So it was, it was classified a medium risk for speed. The roadside entrances, uh, the presentation of our uh, uh, residents, um, they live on, they actually don't live on this road. They live on West Street, but um, there's really not a lot of entrances. It was still considered low for entrances. Um, there's quite a stretch here where there's no, hardly any entrances. And uh, so it still ranks as low on our, um, on our scale because it's less than 30 or 10 commercial entrances per kilometer. Uh, there's uh, you know, two intersections and then one at Summer Street here. So it's still considered low as the, as the volume on those roads is very low. Uh, very low on roadside hazards. Um, the operating speed, uh, we consider it low risk because our, our um, operating speed average was 66 and it was posted 60, this area in the light blue here. So, you know, if, if people were uh, really exceeding it or way under it, that would kind of guide us into where we should be. Uh, it is considered low risk for accident history. There's been some accidents. Um, generally winter uh, condition accidents, not, not really speed related accidents. So uh, we did, however, look at this stretch 70 in the yellow from West Street to Gray Road 17 and it's posted 70. Um, now people generally go that speed there because there really isn't much there. Um, but because of the shoulder width, we're recommending that that go to a 60. So we thought maybe that's a compromise to slow people down coming towards uh, where there is some residence um, to make the entire road 60. It's currently uh, posted a 60, then a 70. Uh, our residents that came uh, to do the uh, delegation here at council, we're hoping for a 50. Uh, we're recommending a 60. You'll excuse me for kind of looking down at my paper the whole time. I've, I've got a bunch of stuff going on here. Well, I have two screens. I almost need a third one. Pat, there may be some questions now, Councillor Berwin. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden and uh, Pat. Uh, I'm going to try to put on, keep my county council hat on, but I will be referring to myself as uh, the mayor of Georgian Bluffs, which I am. Uh, a great technical report, but a failure report in this particular area, 17B, does not address the safety concerns which have been pointed out by the delegation of the county council and to many, many residents in the last week or two that have called me. Uh, we, it's a very unique road from uh, Summer Street to the top of the hill where West Street comes out. There's a parking lot there for a walking trail that people tend to try and park on. I've gone on this road many times in the last few days. I've set up West Street. There's a real concern when you come out of West Street for line of sight where the hill comes down towards West Street. You really, really have to be very careful trying to pull out because of you can't see the vehicle until the very last second before you come down over that hill. And that's a real concern. Uh, it, this particular section of road from West Street to Summer Street is in a real residential area. We had Park Street coming out in there too. And I really feel that, I hope the county will look at addressing more safety concerns to do with traffic, vehicle, people walking and so on. And uh, I understand that we, the county is going to put on bicycle trails coming up through there too. And I, I really think it's gonna to add to the whole congestion in that area that yes, bicycle lanes are great, but I'm really concerned with the safety of the residents in this particular area. And uh, by re reducing the speed from Summer Street to at least past West Street, I really feel it's going to help solve some of the issues. But it's those, there, yes, there's very few residents coming out of there, but I have personally went into some of their driveways to look to see their sight lines. I don't think they get great sight lines coming out of their driveways. When they come out of West Street, there's even trees that I believe are on the, probably the county right away that are impacting the sight line, looking down the hill and looking up the other way. Things like that, I think we really need to address. 
Uh, I had a resident made a very good point to me, which I've seen it done through different areas. I've even seen it in Georgia Bluffs. The simple cost would be to put a painted sign on the road, slow down or whatever. And it's, believe it or not, it's very effective. We're getting a lot of traffic through this area. It's uh, maybe COVID has cost a bit more, but I challenge any kind of council to go to sit in the section of the road, just sit there for 10 or 15 minutes and look at the volume of the traffic, anything from big trucks to uh, small vehicles to camper trailers, whatever, following that road. It's a very congested road there at various times of the day, but I really wish the county would look at the safety concerns that we have along that road. And there's nothing more I can say right now. I can speak to that, Mr. Warden. Um, yeah, those intersections, and, and we went out and looked at them again uh, after the uh, presentation, we've looked at them before. Uh, you'll find with, with um, intersections that meet uh, the minimum visibility standards. If it's if it's not, people get used to um, side roads far exceeding the visibility standard. Um, all these side roads actually do meet the visibility standards. Those trees at West Street are on private property, by the way. We did check those out too. Um, but there is that general feeling of uncomfortableness um, that you don't have as much time at certain intersections as you do at others. Um, that being said, it does meet the minimum standard. We've measured it. It's not unsafe. Uh, th there's no deficiency there, um, but there is more uh, time in other places, for example, which makes you feel a little more uncomfortable. Um, yeah, we are paving the shoulders on that that uh, road as well. Uh, that's that's uh, started now for construction, and and I agree with you. Like I, there is there's four to five thousand cars a day um, going through there, so it's very very busy. Um, there is people. I've been driving that road for 18 years, every day. And uh, there is walkers and, and hikers and that type of thing on it. Um, that being said, um, I'd like people to slow down. We'd all like people to slow down. Um, I just don't feel changing it to 50 is necessarily going to accomplish that. Um, because our concern is all you're doing is creating bigger speed differentials. Um, you know, because you have the person that will go 45 and then you have the no, person that's still going to go 75. That's my concern. Anything else, Councilor Burley? Yes, I, I, I understand your way of thinking, Pat, as a director of transportation for the county. I understand that. And I do know you travel that road practically every single day. But I still wish the county would take another look at the safety concerns along the road itself. By paving the shoulders and so on, yes, it's probably going to help, but it's still not going to solve the problems of safety concerns. And I've talked to many, many residents through that area and even from out of the area, they all have the same concerns. And yes, uh, reducing speed limits is not necessarily gonna solve the problem of speeding, but I'm just, I have a real concern with the safety concerns on the county side and even on the Georgian bus side. Is there something we can do with better signage uh, indicating, uh, uh, for instance, the parking lot where the trail is on top of the hill, uh, a caution signs or something at West Street, just some other avenues we can take just to make sure we've addressed all the safety concerns we possibly can. And that's my big concern and thank you. Thank you, sir. Next is Councillor Potter. Uh, thank you. And uh, I think uh, along the same lines as Councillor Burley, uh, we're seeing a lot of that extra traffic now too. And, and I just recently received a, a comment from a, a local uh, resident representing several residents who live around the area of the intersection of Gray Roads 13 and 40 uh, about uh, the amount of traffic, how much it's grown. Not so much that they understand that, but the speeds. And so I see that we are, we have controls in place uh, as you get into uh, Clarksburg, but uh, what they were asking for, and I will forward this to Pat later on, uh, is is to move that back uh, to south of Gray Road 13 on or sorry on Gray Road 13 south of Gray Road 40 instead of north. Uh, in other words, as you approach that intersection, to start reducing the speed there because uh, people are keeping up the speed as they go into the village of Clarksburg, even though there are two sharp bends there. Uh, also, a request 
that once we get into the village of Clarksburg uh, for a flashing yellow light uh, at the intersection of Clark Street. Uh, so these generally come under the same heading that Councillor Burling was talking about, is that we're seeing more and more and more traffic in some of these areas. And I think as a county council, uh, our first concern has to be safety and the safety of our residents, the safety of the traveling public and the visitors to this area. No one will thank us uh, for the accidents that take place. They will thank us for the lives we save and the people whose, whose lives are not disrupted. So uh, anything we can do that will help protect the public when they're on our roads uh, will, be, will be good. So, uh, we're hearing, you know, these are all specifics, but we're hearing it under the general nature of time for us to look at the way our area is growing and realize that it's time to slow things down a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Councillor Sampson, you're next. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Warden. A um, couple of questions. One is, are there a list of uh, considerations that the county has has looked at that didn't make this list and and uh, are there ways in which this next list can have some new candidates added to it because I think Councillor Potter just spoke of a couple there are a couple more that popped up from concerned citizens that I've uh, had to deal with and meet with uh, call up our bend on highway two is a rather dangerous bend that should be dealt with as far as speed is concerned but it leads me into my next question which I think is on a number of people's minds what traffic calming measures are we employing across the county or will we deploy across the county uh, okay. to help people stay within the limits that, we're, that are there are set or we are now setting? And are we looking at things like the electronic speed flashing signs that are now being deployed in a number of other neighboring counties? Uh, and even MTO is looking at, as I gather, to encourage drivers to stay within the limit as opposed to drive with at whatever limit they feel is, is safe as opposed to what the legal limit is. I think we should take a look at that. Uh, I know for me, it certainly makes a difference when I see the flashing sign that says I'm going 80 and it's a 60K zone and I adjust my speed. I'm just wondering whether or not that's a, a helpful tool we can use across the county in some of these uh, areas where, as Councillor Potter spoke to, we need to take a look at the safety impact and, and, uh, and how we need to do things to help make sure our community is safe. Hey, Pat. Through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, yeah, I'll, I guess I'll handle those questions a little bit here. The, the additional traffic calming, we, we did have a traffic calming pilot. Uh, we were going to install it in Kimberly and uh, Hanover. Um, the uh, the, the uh, kind of um, signs in the middle of the road on the lane, and then there'd be one on each uh, edge line. A uh, lot of pushback from the OFA. Um, as most of these problems are Hamlet related problems, um, all the, you know, the OFA said, well, the farm equipment, they do fall down uh, those, those uh, barricades. They're not really barricades, but, uh, you know, signs. Um, the problem is, is the, the OFA was really against it and some trucks were against it. And the only other thing is they really take a beating. We've been going through a bunch of them in Hanover. I don't know if people, and, and Bruce County had mentioned this to us too. You don't know if people run over them for fun um, or if people aren't looking and they're on their phone and they're just barreling through them. But we've had some that only lasted, um, you know, less than a week. Um, the other thing, the electronic signs, um, we already have one in Kimberly, the flashing sign that that, that Gray Highlands put up. Um, People do get desensitized. It seems like every traffic calming measure, um, people get desensitized to. Um, and and I, knew, I know we do have a report to bring forward talking about traffic cameras as well in, in community safety zones and school zones. But, um, and, and just the only other thing I mentioned, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna paint it like we're not concerned about safety. That is our number one concern. But then you look at, at certain things, like you look at the Highway 26, right? MTO made it 50 for a year as a pilot program. They had the first head-on collision they've ever had in the last five years. Was that because someone got impatient? Was it good that it was 50 to save a life that it wasn't 80? Or is it just a coincidence that it got 
you know, that there was a head on when they changed it to 50 uh, without any real traffic data to do that. Um, and then the, the, the police in that area really weren't happy with the 50. There was huge queues. There was impatient drivers. So um, we all want safety. Um, and maybe making it 50 will work great. Maybe as a society, if every road was 30 over the course of 50 years, maybe we'd actually figure out we don't need to go that fast and it's only going to save us two minutes. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's equated to seatbelts and drinking and driving, which, you know, it took, it is still taking uh, decades to get people to buy into, um, but it's definitely better than it used to be. So um, I don't feel like I'm here to argue about whether it should stay a 60. That's what our policy says. Um, if people want to try a 50 and see if it makes an impact and we end up changing it back, it's not the end of the world either. Um, unless it results in an accident, of course, but, um, you know, uh, that's kind of where we're at. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councillor Desai. Thank you, Warden Hanks. Um, and I just want to say a, a thank you to Pat. Uh, I know speeding is a it's a, it's a hot button issue, and and I always admire tra tra transportation is a hot button issue. And I always admire um, the care and the the effort that Pat puts into explaining the technical details of it uh, to to members of council. Um, I also do appreciate the uh, the traffic calming efforts that that are being proposed that have. Uh, taken place already. Um, one of the, and, and this is going back to the last term of council, at which point I was on a county council, but it was a discussion that was had at, uh, at the lower tier at the municipality of Grey Highlands Council, um, where one of the oppositions to having uh, the flashing signs with the with the speed uh, limit showing on, or not the speed limit, but the your speed showing on there, uh, was that many people take that as a, what's the highest score I can get? Uh, and it becomes a bit of a game for them. And it's unfortunate, but it, it is true. Uh, there's data to show that that has happened in, in some cases. Uh, my question, and perhaps comment at this point, Warden Hicks, is that one way to ensure that people travel the speed limit through a certain area is to have the automatic speeding enforcement uh, units. Uh, are they expensive? Yes, they are. Um, but we can't have safety and cost savings at the same time. Uh, if we had to pick one, which one are we picking? Um, we're noticing that we're not getting cost savings with, um, with the, um, the traffic calming measures where, as, as uh, Director Hoy suggested, uh, we're not sure if people are running into them on accident or on purpose, but we're not getting uh, traffic calming through that. And I doubt we're getting traffic safety from that if they're running into these uh, these pylons. So maybe we need to spend more money and get a speeding enforcement, which is automatic. There is no uh, discretion involved. There is no uh, emotions involved. Uh, you're going at a certain speed. You've got a ticket because you went above uh, the set speed limit. So I know, I know that there is, uh, well, the last time I brought it up, I know uh, Director Ho had suggested that, you know, the, the downside of it was that if people don't speed, we don't have a way to pay for those uh, units. What I'm saying to county council is that's a gamble, perhaps, but if people aren't speeding, it does mean that we have safer roads and we've just spent money to provide a safer road, which I don't think is a bad investment. I wouldn't call that an expense. I would perhaps call that an investment. So I would like for County Council to revisit that issue of having speeding the, the speed enforcement units and perhaps looking and perhaps directing staff to look into units that are mobile so that they can be moved to problem area to problem area because 17B, once that issue or once the speeding on that road is solved, that it doesn't solve all our speeding issues. We, we can still have speeding issues in other, other jurisdictions, other areas. So if we have a mobile unit, we can move that around and maybe we need to spend some money on that and, and ensure that we can have a safer road. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the time, Warden Hay. Pat, any comments? Yeah, yeah, through you, Mr. Warden. Yeah, I think it's September is we're gonna bring that, cam that report back about the cameras. Um, and I, and, and I and I know what, what uh, Councillor Desai is saying. It's it's kind of you know hand in hand with the Vision Zero initiative, which we haven't fully adopted yet. 
um, we're we're still most municipalities in North America are still um, kind of uh, like things meet the standard, right? Um, whereas Vision Zero, uh, the theory is, you know, um, people are going to make mistakes. So, you know, when we, sometimes we have someone run a stop sign and there's a T-bone, just a catastrophic accident. Uh, Vision Zero basically is taking the stance that you know someone's going to make a mistake. So design your roads that a mistake isn't catastrophic. Um, you know, more roundabouts, um, you know, uh, chicanes and those kind of things just to force people to slow down because you know they're going to run a sign at some point. Um, and it, there was a, a presentation of Good Roads where um, I think it was in northern Sweden or something. There was a there was a road with a lot of head-on collisions, like three or four head-on collisions a year. So they ended up putting um, and there's a group that wants to do the same in northern Ontario on on Highway 11. Um, so they ended up doing like two kilometer sections. There'd be um, there'd be uh, two lanes going one way and one coming the other with guide rail down the middle. You basically couldn't pass. And then the next section would be two kilometers the other way, or two lanes the other way and one kilometer. So just alternating passing lanes. You only ever had to go two kilometers without having a chance to pass somebody. Um, assuming you can get by the, the phenomenon of everybody speeding up when they can be passed, right? Like that, that still, that seems to happen a lot for some unknown reason that no one can explain to me. But, um, but that is, as Councilor Desai said, that is a lot of money, right? So, but then again, maybe it's a culture change. So, I mean, I, I think I'm here to work with you and we're going to try to figure out um, and make, you know, how, how to, how to reduce speed, which obviously reduces the severity of accidents. Um, it's just the, the thing that worries me is the, the variability of speeds, someone going 40 and someone coming up on them going 70, um, is a big difference in everybody going 65, say. So that's, um, I'm not going to go too much farther on that. Okay. So thank you, Pat. Um, we had talked about going through each uh, area and entertaining questions as we uh, move through each area. Perhaps Mr. Warden. Can, yes. I, I apologize, but I do see that um, uh, Councillor O'Leary has, has a question um, that he noted in the chat. Yes. My apologies. He did uh, put something in the chat. Councillor O'Leary, go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I thought you were ignoring me. <laughs> my apologies. Um, Pat, I'm, I'm just, um, I, I think I heard you say when you're discussing with Councillor Burley that all you would get uh, moving it to 50 kilometers an hour is um, a bigger speed differential. And I think that's exactly what they need. I mean, I didn't hear anyone complaining about the volume of traffic on 17B. It's, it's the people that are racing to, to beat the traffic that's going on the highway. So if it drops to 50 kilometers an hour, I think you eliminate the people that are trying to race around. I, I think that it keeps those people on the highway. Uh, you also mentioned the, the narrow shoulders and if there's bike lanes going in, I think that's even worse. Um, I went back after our, our last discussion when this was at council and spoke to my brother because he lived for years right at the bottom of that hill. And so this is coming from someone that's there every day. And he said that should have been 50 kilometers an hour 20 years ago because of the speed of drivers going by. Um, and the last point I want to make, when you're speaking about Gray Road 13, uh, you're talking about working with the community safety group. And you said you weren't dropping it to 40 kilometers an hour unless the municipality asked for it. And it's my understanding that Georgian Bluffs Council unanimously asked for this speed limit to be dropped to 50. Um, I'm wondering if Councillor Burley could confirm that, but um, I, I just, uh, I, I'm totally shocked that, that this is not being sh dropped to 50. And if, if that was a motion, I would certainly support it. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Councillor Burley. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, not to delay the or discussing this particular 17b i'm still a firm believer uh being very familiar with the road that the speed limit should be dropped from summer street to up past west street to 50 and then from west street to 6 and 10 highway drop to 60. i really feel it would really solve a lot of concerns and safety issues that i have and a lot of residents that area do have uh, and I say, I've talked to many people I know that come, for instance, up Park Street early in the morning, there's not a car to be seen anywhere. 
talk to somebody around 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, it's a completely different road altogether. And I, I, I really would like to not be in the decision of kind of counsel if we find that we have some serious accidents that might happen when the bike lanes are put in place because we didn't really address our safety concerns. It's a real concern of mine. And uh, Mr. Warden, uh, with your permission, I would like to put a motion forward that, uh, that we would drop the speed limit to 50 from Summer Street to uh, West Street. And uh, uh, the very least do that. And then maybe 60 from Summer Street to the highway. Thank you, sir. I'm going to suggest with the aid of uh, Madam Clerk, uh, that perhaps we entertain that and any other uh, amendments uh, at the end of the presentation. Yes, um, please. And so we can at least get through uh, the full report uh, and then I'll invite people and I'm well aware that you'll want to make a, an amending motion. Uh, would that be okay with you, Councillor Burley? Definitely. Okay. Um, Councillors Desai and Carlton, uh, Desai first. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Um, I, I apologize if I lose my train of thought. My fiance is cooking lunch and it smells really good. Um, so I, I'm a bit distracted. Um, but the two questions that I have is we're talking about changing speed limit. Um, realistically, the, p, the driving habits will only change if there is enforcement on speeding limits, on, on, the, on the new speed limits. Um, I can't remember if it was Director Hoy or a predecessor of his who once mentioned about speeding is that people will drive at the speed that the road allows them to drive at, meaning that the engineering of the road, if you have a narrower road, people will drive slower because it seems a, a smaller road and, and they feel a bit more constricted in that, in that regard. Whereas if it was a wider road, people would be uh, naturally predisposed to drive a bit faster. So road design plays a big, big part in what speed uh, people drive at. For example, uh, in Flesheton, um, south of the uh, south of the high school, sorry, north of the high school, uh, was a speeding issue at a time when the sidewalks weren't there. With the sidewalks coming in and the perception that the road was now narrower, uh, speeding hasn't been as big of an issue, from my understanding, as it once was. Um, so, again, road design is an important element of it. If we do, for and, and I'm going to use the hypothetical amendment that Councillor uh, Burley has suggested, if we do change that, um, do we have any jurisdiction as a body to uh, perhaps require increased enforcement along that section, along the sections where we're asking for the uh, speed limit to be changed, um, even though the policy doesn't require that speed limit to be changed? because the policy takes into account the road design and the engineering around that. And if the engineering is going to allow the driver to go at 70 kilometers an hour, then, and we're forcing them to go less than that, then we should have enforcement at least for a limited time so that uh, drivers are forced to go at that 50 kilometers an hour through, uh, through the ticketing process. Uh, thank you, Warden Hicks. Councillor <clears throat> Desai, I'm hearing from staff that we are going to be getting a report on uh, traffic calming measures and um, uh, maybe even road design. Um, so perhaps that's something better addressed at that time or even uh, a further debate about that uh, when we deal with the amendment because you were couching that suggestion in the um, amendment proposed by Councillor Burley. I always knew I was a man ahead of my times. <laughs> Pat, you want to add anything to that? I, I, I would just say that in, enforcement is is um, for for the member municipalities that have their uh, police boards and and that type of thing. So um, we really don't have any control over enforcement, other than uh, we do regularly report to the the enforcement agencies about uh, problem areas. Okay. I'm anxious to move things uh, along. Um, I see Councillor Carlton and then Councillor Potter, and then maybe we can move back to the um, staff presentation. Councillor Carlton. Thank you, Mr. Horden. I'd just like to speak to a couple of the comments that uh, Mr. Hoy made. 
One of them being about the comfort level of drivers. And I think on that road, when you look at all of the streets that come out onto Grey Road 17B, they all come out onto it at an angle. They don't come straight at it. So I, and on West Street, you're not only coming at 17B on an angle, now you're trying to look around and down a hill. And so your sight line is, you're pulling out onto the road to be able to see down that hill. The other comment was that there are not a lot of driveways on 17B, and I would agree there, but I think it's the layout of West Street and Park Street, the number of driveways there, and their only access getting into town is down 17B. So that adds to the traffic. So while those driveways aren't on 17B, they're certainly, it's their only way into town sort of heading on out and going in 24th Street, which is the long way, they're not gonna do that. So just a couple of comments there about, um, I drive that road a lot, so I see a lot of this all the time, as well as the Bruce Trail coming out onto it and Gray Sobble and the hikers and walkers. So there's a lot on that road all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carlton. Uh, Councillor Potter. Uh, thank you, Ms. Warden, and through you, uh... I, I just wondered if uh, I would be in, in full support of Councillor Burley's earlier motion, if we could add that, uh, that staff review the other issues raised, uh, as well as what Councillor Burley already brought up regarding uh, uh, the one road. Uh, and forgive me, my memory is slipping at the moment, but. Uh, there were issues raised by myself, by Councillor Sampson, uh, Councillor Carlton, Councillor O'Leary, and a few others uh, regarding specific issues. Uh, and I wonder if, uh, if we could ask uh, Pat and his department to review those uh, and report back uh, it, during the fall. If we could add that to the motion, I would be uh, prepared to, to certainly support it and second it if necessary. Thank you. So just to be clear, we're not on the motion uh, as yet. Uh, no, I, I, I do understand that. I just, if it comes up. Yeah. So why don't we wait until uh, that does uh, come up? I, 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 I hear you uh, loud and clear, uh, but it's probably best uh, dealt with when the, the motion is, uh, uh, is placed. Um, Pat, I'd like you to get back to your report, if you could, please. Yeah, I just want to briefly, uh, I'll start that, but I just want to answer Councillor Potter's question. So that's kind of what we started a few, probably a year and a half ago or whatever, that um, all these requests to come in from residents, they end up working their way into this report, whether we turn them, you know, recommend against them or not. Um, because in the past, we found that um, we would get a complaint from a resident, we'd run it through our policy, you know, we'd say, oh, the policy is 60, and that's where it's going to stay. And um, they didn't seem to have a lot of... Uh, enjoyment out of the fact that it never went anywhere. No, they didn't feel like anybody um, was addressing their complaint, even though we did. Um, any, any complaint we get, like the ones you just mentioned, Councillor Potter, we'll start, we'll squeeze it into our next um, 4788 bylaw update report. So I'll just go back to our, oh, sorry, I gotta go back. I'll just finish these last uh, two, three schedules here. Um, so schedule O is the, uh, community or a school zone a speeding. Um, uh, there's just the uh, Derby school is not there anymore. So there doesn't need to be a school zone. And then in, uh, in Holstein, the whole, the whole uh, community is 40. So uh, we didn't need a, a, a flashing 40 during school hours. Uh, Kimberly, again, this is just schedule P, which is extending the, as, you, as we showed on the figure, this is just extending the community safety zone and schedule U is no parking. So there was a request um, outside of Sinclair Auctions on Gray Road 4 um, that we make that no parking. And we had talked to um, Mr. Sinclair and he does two or three sales a year. And um, he does have parking on site. Um, I'm assuming it fills up over time. Um, there it's not enough or something. Um, but again, with economic development, we didn't really wanna you know, impact his business too negatively. Um, we've never noticed that it was a large safety concern. Um, the auctions are rare. Um, so we're recommending against that right now. But again, that's an area that we're going to continue to monitor. And I think the last. Um, uh, 
Oh, the no parking, of course, in Greater 30 is the last one, which I already discussed. Uh, the only thing I haven't discussed is the, and it was big in the presentation uh, for them, the 17B uh, delegation about ways and, uh, and, and basically the, um, you know, your GPS directing people to go through 17B. So uh, Waze has kind of told us they, they can't put a stop on people going somewhere or their, their algorithm directing people somewhere. And uh, I, I do think that road, although the delegation seemed to think it was, you know, um, um, the people's GPS directing them how to get to solve and stuff. That road is pretty heavy with people just taking the shortcut in town that know about it. Um, because I know lots of times, you know, on a Friday night of a long weekend, I'm taking that road to get home. And all the other people are out on the highway lined up from, uh, you know, the old drive in all the way to Spring Mount and lined up from Spring Mount all the way south of the Georgian Bluffs um, hall or uh, uh, headquarters. So um, I do think uh, really 17B is a lot of local traffic and people, as Councillor Leary mentioned again, people are using it to try to shave a minute and a half or two minutes off um, their trip. So that's what happened. That seems to be its major use. Thank you, sir. Are you now finished? Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor McQueen. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. Um, just going back to the uh, Kimberly area and just re looking at that recommendation, sir. I know that there has been a number of years of issues with regard to speeding through Kimberly, and I know that we have resist it going to below the 50 kilometers. And we had talked about the um, uh, uh, traffic calming and, and the issues that you're talking about with OFA. I think it's at this time and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna make this request to County Council and I would suggest probably my deputy mayor would support me on this as well as, is that uh, to reduce it to 40. I think there's an issue that the other issue that happens in Kimberly, it's on a downward slope. And maybe you don't have the tendency to have people as much speeding up the hill, but it has a tendency. Now, now I know you're reducing, definitely reducing that speed earlier, but I think it's, uh, you know, I know that up the road through um, uh, Eugenia has been, you know, it's been at 40. Uh, we've started to do other areas. And uh, I guess I will say, and, and probably similar to the representatives of Georgian Bluffs and and others, you know, we are elected to make these decisions. We probably have a better understanding of the residents and, and the concerns of our local municipalities. And, you know, I would res, you know, respectfully submit that we uh, make a change to the report that we reduce the, the Kimberly area in the, right in the hamlet itself from 50 to 40. Thank you, Mr. Ward. I would support that if we're doing amendments at this point. So that, that's where I'm going. Uh, Madam Clerk, um, am, am, am I okay to deal with amendments at this point? Yes, you are, sir. We've okay. been sort of drafting them on the side here while the conversations are going on. Okay, so very good. So why don't we deal with the amendment brought by uh, Councillor McQueen with respect to grade 013 in, in Kimberley. So it's moved by uh, Councillor McQueen and uh, seconded by Councillor Desai uh, and if I heard him correctly, that green zone that we see in the middle, the existing uh, 50, uh, be reduced to 40 kilometers per hour. Have I got it right? That's correct. At least from my perspective, I guess, Pat, is any comments to that? Okay. So now we'll open it up uh, uh, for discussion. Uh, Paul, you were asking uh, Pat for input on that. Yeah, just if there's any other comments, but that was a section of, of the area. And I know, Mr. Warden, I know that we talked about holding off to try the, the traffic calming. And I think uh, uh, Councillor Desai does make a good point where in Flasherton, when we reduced uh, the width and, and at the sidewalks, that did help slow. But I know when things narrow, that does help. But it just seems to be a continuation. And I know we had a delegation to us, was it last council or council before um, with uh, with concerns and, uh, but we still wanna move traffic through there is just a recognition of slowing things down. And, and there is the issue about sidewalks and 
where people have to walk sort of on the edge of the road. And I know we're doing some, some sidewalks uh, outside there, but generally if it's, especially in the winter time, you got snow banks and stuff like that. It is just seems to be a busy road. So yes, thank you, Mr. Ward. Pat, do you want to add anything to that? Or do you yeah, know just, just the one have? thing I, I would like to, to um, discuss this with our engineering guys a little more that if it's going to 40, uh, maybe, you know, rather than an 80, 70, 40 step down, maybe it's an 80, 60, 40 then at that point. Um, I have to look into the uh, geometric design manual to see exactly um, what the policies are on that. But uh, that'd be something we could we could um, update for the, when the bylaw comes. Uh, um, whether it should be that yellow area should be, you know, 70 to 40 is quite a step down as well if yeah. it's going 70 to 40, right? So maybe that should be a 60 then if, if we're determined to get, um, you know, the, the urban area to 40. So, um, Mr. But I would like to, to talk to engineering a little more about that. So how would I word, how would we word that motion that that could um, if that's the direction, but it would come back in the sense of the blending? Is that I think I hear the blending of of speed. Yeah, that... yeah, we'd have to just change the the schedule N. Um, schedule N has a lot of uh, that's the one thing I kind of glossed over. Schedule N has a lot of changes just based on descriptions and stuff, location, making the sign um, as posted in the bylaw meet the field location. Um, so we would go back and instead of it saying 70 in that area, we would change it to 60. So um, we could probably do that as a, as a pretty small um, item when the bylaw comes back, I think. I don't know. I don't know what you'd want in your motion now necessarily, but um, as far as a transition zone or whatever, whatever you want to call it, I don't, I'm not sure. Maybe the wording would be, that. maybe the wording, Mr. Wording would be in the green zone, reduce it to 40 and the transitional zones be adjusted according, according to the, is there some kind of a engineering suggestion that would blend those to that 40, like however that wording needs to be? I wonder, Mr. Warden, if we could just include it as a, um, a progressive step down. I think that's sort of what Pat has alluded to in earlier conversations. And then staff could bring that um, through with the bylaw uh, and certainly for council's consideration still. But nevertheless, uh, Madam Clerk, we still have to deal with the motion, which is that yes. that green area be dealt, be brought down to uh, 40. Um, and perhaps the uh, addition to that motion could be uh, with a staff recommendation about the two, um, I guess, what do you call them? Uh, approaching Blended. zones. Yeah. What's the right word for that? Yeah. Uh, and, a re and a review, um, a staff review of progressive um, speeds within the village of Kimberly. Approaching zones, right? Yeah. Approaching zones, yeah. Does that sound uh, reasonable enough for you, uh, Deputy Warden? Yep, as long as that gives a clear direction of what we're trying intending here to do. And, and I, I certainly agree. It doesn't make sense to go, you know, one speed and all of a sudden drop 30 kilometers like that. <laughs> it doesn't, so, uh, it makes sense. It makes really good sense so for sure. So just to be clear, uh, the amendment that's being proposed is that that green area uh, be yep. reduced from the recommended, uh, uh, excuse me, staff are proposing 50, that it be reduced to 40. And in addition, that the, the motion is also that staff bring back recommendations about those two approaching uh, zones. That's oh, what we're voting on. Uh, yes. And uh, I see Councillor Potter has a, a question about this. Just very quickly, I just wanted to follow up on my earlier one. And I, Pat, I don't envy you this at all, <laughs> but uh, just to make to see if whether I could follow up and uh, the items that were captured earlier, because I think we all agree with most of the uh, list in the report. But if we could capture these other items for review, I'm not expecting us to make a decision on them today, but uh, if they could be reviewed again with in in light of what's been raised today. Uh, would it be fair to say that you've taken note of those uh, yeah. questions and that will yeah. be addressed in the upcoming uh, staff report? Sure. Yeah. Are you satisfied with that, Councillor Potter? Okay. So you're nodding your head. All right. So back, uh, I don't see any other hands. So we're about to vote on the amendment with respect to Gray Road 13 uh, in Kimberley. And the motion essentially is uh, that the green area be reduced to 40 and that staff bring back some recommendations with respect to two approaching zones north and south of that green section. So I will call the question, is there anyone opposed uh, to that motion? Uh, I can't see uh, hands, Madam 
uh, clerk. Can you stop sharing your screen? Yep. For just a second. Thank you. Okay, so we're calling the question. I'm looking to see if there's anyone opposed to that motion by uh, Councillor uh, McQueen and seconded by Councillor Desai. Uh, seeing none, I'm going to say that that is carried. Okay. Uh, Councillor Burley, I think I'll turn to you next because you have a proposed uh, amendment as well. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I would like to propose that uh, the speed limit be reduced to 50 from Summer Street to up to the top of the hill at West Street, and then from West Street to the highway reduced to 60. Uh, we in Georgian Bus appreciate the county making this road nice with paved shoulders and so on, but I have real concerns with uh, putting uh, these paved shoulders on and all my other concerns I had with uh, some traffic and safety concerns and, and that's my motion. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm gonna call for a seconder in a second, but I wonder Pat, if you could please bring up your screen again uh, and put it on that Gray Road 17B. Thank you. Make it a little bit bigger. If you oh, yeah. Excellent. Now, Councillor Burley, as you are talking about the proposed change that you want, I wonder, Pat, if you might just with your uh, point, yeah. yes, um, tell us what he's talking about here. So, so yeah. Councillor Burley, go ahead. Do you want me to do it or do you want uh, the Director of Transport? Or if Pat's got it, yeah. Yeah, I, I can do it. Yeah. So, sure. Uh, so the motion would be for this uh, light blue section here to be 50 and for this yellow, which he's got right to the highway, which uh, kind of makes sense as well, because it's pretty short, um, that this would be 60, I guess, from probably highways, probably rather than to Gray Road 17, as I think might be in the chart. Um, well, I guess it's a different road, right? Uh, this is actually 17. So when you say right to the highway, um, I'm not sure what the bylaw says about what this stretch is, to be honest with you. Um, so I'm just not sure how to word that. I guess it's 17B from West Street to Gray Road 17 and Gray Road 17 from 17B to Highway 6 to 60 kilometers an hour. That would be really what the what you're looking for. That's what I'm suggesting, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And that's seconded by Councillor Keevan. Or was it Carlton? I can't remember which one. <laughs> I think it was Councillor Carlton. Councillor Carlton, my apologies. I'm still in that whole Stephen Carlton thing. I do um, see Councillor Burley. Councillor Burley, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Warden, I'm requesting record a vote and I'd like to see the full screen, please. Yeah, is there any other um, discussion or comment on the uh, amendment before we call the vote? Seeing none. Okay, we are ready. Madam Clerk, we're in your hands. Okay, thank you, Mr. Warden. So we are just voting on the amendment for the two changes outlined by Councilor Burley and Mr. Hoy. Um, I will note, uh, Mr. Warden, that Councilor Millen has left the meeting. Okay, uh, Councilor Mackey. Can I? Sorry, sorry. Yes. Can I? Can I have the motion repeated for clarity, please? Okay. I have to go back to the screen. If if. Uh, with some clear, with a little bit of um, indulgence, um, that this be added to the second clause, with the exception uh, rates of speed on Gray Road 17B from West Street to Summer Street be posted at 50 kilometers an hour. That's the rate of way. speed on Gray Road 17B from West Street to Gray Road 17 be posted at 60 kilometers an hour. And the rate of speed from seven, Gray Road 17 to 17 from 17B to Highway six be posted to 60 kilometers an hour. Your clarity, uh, Councillor Desai? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, now, clerk, okay. we're back in your hands for the vote. Thank you. Councillor Mackey. In favor. Councillor Gamble. In favor. Councillor Burley. In favor. Councillor Carlton. In favor. Councillor McQueen. In favor. Councillor Desai. In favor. Councillor Patterson. In favor. Warden Hicks. 
In favor? Councilor Klumpus. Favor. Councilor Keaveny. In favor. Councilor Body is not with us. Councilor O'Leary. In favor. Councilor Woodbury. Favor. Councilor Millen has left. Uh, Councilor Sampson. In favor. Councilor Potter. In favor. <laughs> Councilor Robinson. In favor. And Councilor Hutchinson. Yeah, in favor. Motion is carried 79 to zero. Thank you very much. So council, any other uh, amendments to deal with or can we go to the main uh, motion now? Going once, twice, I do not see any hands. So I'm ready to call the question on the main motion now. Go ahead, Madam Clerk. Um, are the original mover and seconder okay with moving the main motion now as amended? Yeah, that's a good, uh, I see nodding of heads. I see, okay, thank you. Okay. So um, I'll call the question on the main motion now as amended. Is there anyone opposed? Seeing no hands, I'm gonna say that that is carried. All right, so here we are now. Uh, I'm going to suggest uh, we have uh, made arrangements for our second delegation to be delayed to uh, 115. It doesn't give us uh, a lot, a lot of time, especially if you're as slow an eater as I am. I'm gonna suggest that we take a break and come back at 1.15 and continue with the agenda at that time. Anyone have anything to say about that or are we good? All right, so we'll see you all at 1.15. Cheers.
How are we doing? We still need a few more. <laughs> I'm not the only slow eater. Olivia, can you uh, bring us back to full screen, please? Good. We're getting there. I think we have quorum. Yes, we do. Well, a few seconds. Okay, I think we'll get us uh, started. Olivia, are we good to go? You are good to go. Thank you very much. Uh, so council, welcome back. Hope you had a little, <laughs> get a little something into your bellies. Um, we're gonna go back to our second uh, delegation uh, from Hempson dealing with the growth management uh, study. Uh, it's Stefan and Stefan, I am going to butcher your name. So maybe I better not even try, is it? Kershetsunowich. Uh, it is not Warden, but uh, that's certainly very, very close. <laughs> I shouldn't have even thank, tried. Thank, I, thank I, you for trying. Thank you for trying. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Stefan, um, we have your uh, materials, and you've got the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Warden. And I'm going to just share my screen here. Uh, if you uh, bear with me. Um, can everyone see that? We can, yes. Great, thank you. Um, I'll just change this to there. Okay, uh, well, thank you once again, Warden. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, my, my name is Stefan Chetronovich. I, I work for Hemson Consulting. Um, and really the purpose of my presentation uh, to you and Council today is to present to you the results of the work that we were retained to do um, to revise the county's growth forecasts as part of the update uh, to its um, growth management strategy and uh, in turn, uh, the county official plan. And it, it concludes uh, many months of work um, in partnership with your staff um, and uh, staff and external consultants retained by um, the area municipalities uh, in the county. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, very briefly uh, <clears throat> about the demographic trends um, that uh, serve uh, as, as the basis for the forecasts. Uh, and then uh, I will present you uh, the forecast results and they'll be presented as re results uh, for the county as a whole, uh, as well as um, uh, separate forecasts for each of the area municipalities. And we'll be looking at population, uh, households, uh, housing units by unit type uh, and uh, jobs or, and uh, jobs by land use type as well. 
Um, <clears throat> first, I want to just talk a little bit about um, population growth trends uh, in the county. Um, I'm sure members of uh, council will be aware that, um, you know, in the last five years, the county's experienced uh, a significant increase in uh, population growth. Um, it was actually started almost at a, around the exact time of the 2016 census, uh, and the change was um, uh, very rapid um, and, and, and quite immediate. And there are several reasons for this happening. Uh, the first is that there are sort of demographic forces at play, uh, very broad demographic forces, uh, which are bringing millennial, uh, the, the, the millennials into the housing market. Um, and um, while baby boomers, the peak baby boom remains sort of 60 years old and, and very active in the housing market, uh, but there are also shifts in the housing pattern for baby boomers as well. Um, the second factor is of course that um, pressure on the housing market um, has um, increased uh, um, affordability uh, uh, issues in the greater Toronto area and its hinterland, uh, which has put pressure on housing markets a bit further afield. Uh, and this uh, is bringing um, parts of gray into the sort of the orbit of the, the broader regional housing market, particularly in areas like Dundalk in, in Southgate. Um, and at the same time, you know, there's the ongoing development of the lakeshore communities in, in the county, Meaford, uh, Town of the Blue Mountains, which continue to be the, the, the location for a lot of uh, development and growth. And then, of course, we have COVID, um, <clears throat> which in many respects has accelerated some of these, uh, these trends that, that were occurring um, before um, uh, COVID uh, descended on us. Um, but may have accelerated, for example, things like the early retirement of some baby boomers, uh, their desire to convert a second home into a permanently occupied dwelling, um, and you know the desire by some people to start um, what was a temporary working work at home experiment and convert that into a more permanent um, lifestyle. So, uh, all all that being said, there are strong indications for sustained high growth in the future in the county, and certainly in the near term. Uh, if you look at the table, um, the the top table on the right, you can see since 2016 we've had uh, around about 1.4 percent population growth per annum overall in the county. That compares to 0.3 percent per annum between 2011 and 2016 and population decline between 20, 2006 and 2011. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a change. And if you look at the bottom chart, you can see that our expectations uh, for growth in the 2018 growth management strategy, which were based, um, which did not have the benefit in some respects of the 2016 census, um, uh, have been far exceeded over the last five years. Uh, and, in, and indeed, the, the gap has widened during the COVID period, if anything. Uh, the other thing to point out to, to, to Council is that this is not a phenomenon that has been unique to Gray. Um, and so we've seen very high population growth in uh, jurisdictions at the edges of the Greater Golden Horseshoe uh, ever since 2016. Um, though not always for the same reasons. So there are certainly very particular, um, uh, there's a particular dynamic that's, that's uh, occurring in gray, um, but uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the growth itself is, is, um, is certainly a feature of, of the landscape uh, at the fringe of the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Um, the other thing to point out is that the recent population growth um, is not just in one location. Uh, it's, uh, it's evident throughout the county. Uh, so this, uh, this bar chart here um, shows for the three um, uh, census periods uh, uh, leading up to today. So the, the green is the 2006 to 11 census period. And, and that was a period of population decline or stability um, in some places, with the exception of Hanover in the middle. Uh, where you can see where they, they had population growth in the town there. 
and then we have the gold portions of the bar, um, which represent um, the sort of recovery from the 0809 recession, which was quite slow in many places of the province, including Gray, um, where we have some population growth starting starting to occur, uh, except in Meaford. Um, and then, um, and Owen Sound. And then in the red, we have the, the rapid growth that I've just been describing, uh, except in, in Owen Sound. And it's not to say that there isn't development activity in Owen Sound, there certainly is, uh, but it's offset by um, a much older um, and an aging population there. Um, and so, you know, Town of the Blue Mountains, the fastest growing municipality, has been for some time. Uh, but as I say, the Lakeshore municipalities and Georgian Bluffs and Meaford, um, um, proportionately um, a rapid growth in the last five years. Southgate, um, very rapid growth in the last few years. And Hanover, indeed, very steady growth over the last 15 years. Um, so this uh, gives you the, the, the population outlook for the county as a whole. Um, as I mentioned, the new forecasts uh, that are here exceed the previous 2018 forecasts. Uh, so the population is anticipated to grow from 103,000 people today to 127,000 by 2046. Um, this represents um, higher growth than are included in the most recent Ministry of Finance projections uh, from 2020 of 121,400 people. Um, and that's because, uh, in part, of the uh, very um, 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 uh, of the opportunities that exist in the development pipeline in the in the very near term. Um, you'll see also, however, that the 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 the, the growth of the population on a countywide basis slows throughout the period to 2046, and that's because you know you are still not immune from the demographic fact of an aging population overall. Uh, and that is a that's a universal feature of most jurisdictions through the province. Um, it's a similar story when we look at growth in households and housing. Uh, we translate the population by age into households and housing by type. Um, and you can see a very rapid um, housing growth in recent years set to continue, but but at a somewhat moderated pace and to uh, be very uh, rapid, certainly higher than the historical average, but um, um, slowing somewhat over the period to 2046. Short term housing growth, as I mentioned earlier, based on a very active development pipeline. Um, and when we look at the building permit issuance that's occurring, uh, very active indeed. Um, this is just the forecast for the permanently occupied housing units. Uh, there will be a seasonal uh, forecast of seasonal uh, units as well, and I'll, I'll show you that in a little bit later. But overall, it's about 10,500 housing units uh, over the next 25 years. When we look at the types of housing, uh, we're looking very closely at the, the market trends that we see on the ground in the county. Um, how those might change uh, as the age structure of the population changes over the next 25 years. Um, and to a, a lesser extent, the effects of planning policies, both provincial policies and county policies that seek to promote certain types of housing, especially affordable housing. Uh, so the, the growth mix moving forward assumes a slight shift away from the low density single detached unit form to perhaps more of a row house form, a more affordable form in certain uh, mainly more urban areas. Uh, and then particularly in Owen Sound, um, a shift towards more apartment forms from the current 14% of the, of the overall share of the market uh, to uh, peaking at around 17% in the early 2040s. I'm sorry to interrupt Mr. Uh, or Stefan and Mr. Warden. I wonder if um, Stefan is interested in questions during the um, presentation, because I do see Councillor Potter, um, or would you prefer to wait till the end? I'm happy to follow the warden's lead. It is germane to this particular slide, Mr. Warden. And, and it is, right uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for your indulgence. Uh, and thank you for your presentation. And I just wondered, uh, we see a great need for more attainable housing. So 
this almost suggests to me that, and, and maybe I'm reading it incorrectly, and I, that's really what I'm asking, uh, is are we going to need more in the way of attainable, that missing middle type of housing uh, in the future? Or is this telling us that that really won't be a requirement? Well, uh, through you, Warden, no, I, I think that it will be a requirement. Um, it will be a, a requirement in, in more areas than others. And so when we when we look in a couple of slides at um, the breakdown of the housing mix in Owen Sound, for example, you will see um, where, the, where the, perhaps there is a concentration of um, the need um, for that type of housing. Uh, you'll see it, uh, a lot of the, uh, the apartments are concentrated uh, in Owen Sound for that reason. Uh, but certainly what you're seeing here, although when you look at the red portion of these bars, you see it only, you know, uh, growing marginally, that's actually quite a significant shift um, uh, for a housing market. Um, so moving on then, just uh, to look at uh, the job side of the of the picture, and if you look historically, you can see that you know the county's experienced quite sporadic employment growth, um, and was hit like many other places um, in the 0809 by the 0809 recession, um, and uh, only indeed started to recover from that, um, you know, in the 2016 2021 period. Um, and, um, you know, the countywide employment forecast will in part be driven by the fact that the population is increasing. Um, a bigger population will need, a more, you know, more services and, and, a, and a broader range of services. Um, and the services sector is a, is a big component of the, the local economy in the county. Um, we were asked to look at COVID impacts and, and certainly, um, you know, we would suggest that a lot of the impacts will be short term. A lot of the lost jobs are jobs that can quickly rebound after we exit this lockdown and we all get vaccinated. Uh, so jobs lost in food and accommodation and tourism, uh, we would anticipate those all being able to rebound um, relatively quickly uh, once this is all over. Um, and um, and indeed, you know, the job losses in gray were not as significant as in many other places of the province because, uh, you know, those losses were offset by an increased um, uh, number of day trippers uh, seeking to escape the, the, the more urban parts of the, the province and, and, as I say, seasonal home use uh, and in migration from, uh, from uh, work at home workers and early retirees and that sort of thing. Uh, I see a hand, um, Mr. Warden. I'd... Councilor Keeveny. All right, yeah, Councilor Keeveny, go ahead. Mr. Warden, if I may, and uh, and thank you, Stefan. I'm curious about your last comment here, suggesting uh, job losses in the food uh, industry, restaurants uh, in particular, because what I'm seeing is that restaurants are struggling more so than they ever have to secure staff. It, it really is a crisis. Restaurants are having to close days during the week and, and, uh, and go forward with uh, lesser opening hours than they have in the past. So I'm, I'm just wondering about your thoughts on that and sort of when um, you arrived at, at the suggestion that, uh, that this is a concern of the jobs lost and at least quickly moved as restaurants have reopened into a position where as I say, restaurant owners are struggling. Yeah, through you, Mr. Warden, and I apologize if if I wasn't clear about this. I mean, what I want meant to imply was that when you look at job losses overall, although there have been some acute job losses in particular sectors, there's also been some, um, you know, uh, there's been offsetting factors um, uh, that have sort of that, that are present in gray that are not present in other places. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, I, that's what I wanted to imply. And I, and I guess the other uh, point to be made is that um, it's, it's from, <clears throat> from the perspective of individual businesses, uh, there is uh, a lot of um, 
um, anguish. I understand that, um, and they may never recover. So, but uh, that is a that is a different thing from looking at the sector as a whole and how it might recover. So we would expect the demand for restaurants, for example, to return once people can return to work. But if, but that's small comfort for somebody who hasn't been able to make it through the actual pandemic period. Good counsel, excuse me. Um, Mr. Warden, if I may, um, yeah, I don't think that wasn't um, quite the point I was trying to make in suggesting that uh, we are at a crisis for workforce. We probably have the lowest unemployment rate in Ontario, and we uh, um, businesses are struggling to get help. And, and I'll just leave it at that. Second. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and, and all good points, and I, I would agree with that too. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the um, the um, uh, uh, land use categories that uh, we divide the the employment into, there's there's really three. Um, there's the employment that's going to be located um, primarily in areas. Um, which are geared towards uh, providing housing, so residential areas, neighborhoods, um, the, the so-called population related employment that meets the needs of local residents, um, both permanent and seasonal residents. So that will be your local retail, accommodation, food, education, other institutions, uh, as well as the work at home jobs. Um, and that the planning for that will be done through the community plans for residential uh, areas. Um, and then we'll have the jobs that um, require, um, which are sort of inactivities that require dedicated lands for employment uses, segregated from residential areas. Uh, and that would be your more industrial, manufacturing, uh, wholesale trade, transportation, construction, that sort of thing. Uh, these will be accommodated on designated employment lands uh, in industrial parks um, and business parks. Uh, and then an important feature of uh, the Gray County employment overall is, is that a lot of economic activity takes place in rural areas, not on designated urban lands. Um, and obviously there are um, agricultural related for sure, uh, but also small scale manufacturing construction that occurs on farms and in other areas in rural areas. Um, and a lot of tourist related activities that occur in rural areas as well. That will continue to remain an important feature of the landscape uh, over the next 25 years. Uh, and so this is a breakdown of those three uh, categories. Um, you can see the largest category is the population related employment in the gold, um, but a significant um, component will be on the employment land uh, on the employment lands and the distribution of those employment lands and the jobs associated with it will largely depend upon the available supply of those lands uh, in uh, uh, across the county uh, and then the rural employment. Um, distribution will will really base uh, will be based on uh, historical trends. Moving now then to the to the distribution of the population uh, between uh, the area municipalities, um, and so there's been a bit of a shift here in the allocation. Uh, in, in 2018, the the growth management strategy assumed that housing would be fairly evenly distributed across the county. Um, uh, no area municipality had a greater than 18% share of the housing growth overall. Um, and uh, so here, uh, it's a little bit more concentrated in, in some areas over others. Um, certainly the, the Blue Mountains, and especially in the early years, is uh, will be the focus for m much of the housing growth. And it has um, more than 50% of all the units that are in the county development pipeline sort of been approved um, uh, or pending approval uh, for development. Um, and then you'll see that there's quite a significant share of population growth assigned uh, to Hanover, uh, recognizing that Hanover is now evolving into a full service community. It has uh, the potential for more housing growth and quite ambitious plans to achieve it as well. 
um, and uh, recognizing the, the, that um, uh, the changes that have occurred in Dundalk um, and the evidence we see from a bit further south in Shelburne, for example, uh, where, um, you know, Shel the people are moving into Shelburne and there is a strong commuting relationship by people living in Shelburne and working in, in Peel region. Uh, we expect that that will spill upwards north into Southgate and, and, and a corresponding increased share of the population to Southgate as a result. Uh, this is a breakdown of the housing units by unit type and, and further to um, uh, the, earlier count, uh, the earlier question uh, by the councillor. Uh, you can see that, you know, the apartments very much focused on the city of Owen Sound, uh, but nevertheless, the, the shift in the housing mix uh, evident um, uh, across the board. Stefan, I do see it, uh, Councillor Sampson. Yes. My apologies, Councillor Sampson, please go ahead. No problem, thank you very much, Mr. Ward. Just on this slide, um, I'm a bit, bit worried that the definition of apartment that you use may not be what we would normally think of an apartment. I know that, for instance, if you take a look at the statistics in the Blue Mountains, it will say that we had uh, we built a hundred and some odd apartments over the last year. Those are, in fact, uh, half a million to three quarter of a million dollar condominiums, mm -hmm. not rented out to anybody, typically occupied by owners, potentially rented out as a ski chalet or whatever, but not readily available uh, in the definition of apartment that I think the common person would have. So I'm just wondering whether or not we, when we talk about apartments, we need to be clear that these are actually, I think the definition the county uses is any building that has three or more units in it, which, uh, which I, I think clearly defines use as it relates to infrastructure demand, but I think would, not be defined truly as an apartment, i.e. something that's rented out to somebody who, who can't afford to own a unit. So I'm just wondering whether or not um, we need to be a little bit clearer when we use that word, because this would imply that we are somehow quite adequately servicing the needs of those who want to rent. And the fact is across the county and certainly in our town, we are not. Uh, I think the number of how rent apartments that have been built over the last year for actual rental by people who want to rent them normally is zero. <laughs> and, and so, but the statistics would not, would not indicate that. So I'm just wondering whether you can comment a bit uh, through you, uh, Mr. Warden, uh, to the presenter on, on, on how we get a little bit finer definition of that. Okay. Well, through you, Mr. Warden, it's a it's an excellent question, and it's a um, you know somewhat difficult to answer. So the the um, the forecasts here by unit type are based upon the built form of building of of, of homes, and the reason for that is because we rely really on the census data uh, to establish the base and and the forecasts. Uh, and all of the census information um, is based on the built form of the units, and so we we do not account for the tenured or the tenure arrangements of units, whether they're rental or owner occupied, for example. Uh, and so I think the phenomenon that the councillor is referring to is is um, is not being picked up in the num in in the figures that you see here. We have not distinguished um, apartments by tenure. Um, and that would be a very different kind of analysis. But uh, certainly I would suggest something that is uh, an important uh, element of, you know, the official plan and the planning policies that's required to sort of, um, you know, get to where you want to achieve. But, but th that, that would not, you're right, be reflected in, in these figures here. Yeah, as a follow up, Mr. Warden, if I can, I guess to the extent that these numbers and these projections are driving that work in the official plan and other documents, I think we need to be mindful that that this call, these two columns here on the apartment growth can be highly misleading as it relates to the use of, of those built forms. And if in fact we have a shortage of those types of uses in the county, we sure as heck better be identifying it and highlighting it and not, uh, as it seems to be here, sort of hidden under a general category that is not really reflecting what's actually going on. Um, built form is helpful, but use is our problem. 
We just don't have rental units in the county. We have none available literally in the town of Blue Mountains. Yet the statistics would seem to indicate that's not the case. And, and, and I worry that when we go down to the provincial level and try to explain the situation, they might look at the data that we're, we're, we're assembling and say, no, that you've got lots of apartments uh, here. What's your problem? When in fact we don't. Councillor Potter, I'm coming to you next, but before that, perhaps uh, our CAO wants to chime in. Thanks, Mr. Warden. I think we're really looking for two different um, pieces of information or two different analysis. Um, as Stefan said, this is really about the, the built form and about land use rather than affordability um, or a further discussion about um, housing attainability. Um, so um, I, I'm not, I think there's room for both of those conversations. I just don't think that the um, affordability question is, is part of this particular analysis. Is that fair, Stefan? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Councillor Potter. Thank you. And uh, I guess to that point, um, a lot of our housing in the Blue Mountains is part time. Uh, and I, I'm not sure Councillor Sampson might, might back me up on this, but I'm not sure I see that reflected here. Uh, we know that there's a lot more housing here than is being shown in in these numbers. And that's not talking about attainable housing. That's talking about uh, part-time and seasonal uh, weekend type of housing. So, uh, and, and eventually we have found that those people become full-time residents. So uh, I, I just wonder how we're reflecting that in this study or if we are. Yes, and, and through you, uh, Mr. Warden, again, that's an excellent question. Thank you, Councillor. These units that you see on the page here are only permanently occupied units. We have done a seasonal unit forecast and, and you'll see that in a few slides to come. Okay, may I continue? Okay, um, this slide just lays out the, um, the distribution of the employment. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the, you know, the population related employment will generally follow the population growth. Um, and um, uh, as far as the employment land employment, uh, that will be um, really concentrated in areas um, which have the ability to provide serviced employment lands. Excuse me. Uh, and this is a breakdown then of the uh, of the jobs by type, uh, by area, municipality. Uh, this then is the slide um, which uh, lays out the seasonal housing unit uh, forecast. So it's it's a separate forecast. It's layered on top of the um, of the um, um, uh, permanent uh, dwellings. So the seasonal homes are shown in gold here, um, and we have them fairly uh, steadily increasing uh, over the period to 2051. And when we look at uh, where they will be concentrated, um, uh, as you might expect, uh, the town of the Blue Mountains, which already has the, the lion's share of these kinds of units, expected to continue to, to um, uh, that to be the case um, over, the, over the long term, uh, and other places like uh, Grey Highlands as well, um, and other, uh, uh, other areas. Um, if I could stop you a second, is that uh, Councillor Potter or Samson uh, help illuminate the question that you were asking about? It, it does. I, I guess I wanted to highlight the point as much as to uh, get an answer, but thank you. And, and that, yes, that does help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, so then uh, just finally, I, I just wanted to stress that um, this has been a highly consultative process. Um, and uh, we've 
<clears throat> we've relied heavily on the uh, advice, um, review and comments we've received uh, from um, area municipalities throughout the process and, and they've certainly informed um, the assumptions uh, and uh, led to uh, a number of revisions of the results to, to make sure that they properly reflect the on the ground conditions uh, in the area municipalities. We had an initial consultation with uh, the area municipalities in uh, in October and that included sort of individual one on one interviews with with staff. Um, and we circulated uh, the results that, that you've seen today to them uh, in the early part of this year. Uh, and we've gone back and forth uh, with, uh, with um, uh, several of them um, on, uh, uh, to make sure that the, that the results sort of reflect, um, you know, the, the, the data on land supply um, and the expectations for near-term growth. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to express my thanks to all those of the area municipalities who who helped with the process and it's been very um, um, valuable to us. And I think it's reflected in the final results. Um, so um, with that, uh, I'm, uh, that, that concludes my presentation and Mr. Warden, I'm, I'm happy to answer any further questions. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Um, going back to your first slide, or maybe it was the second one, when you took a look at the 2018 GMS and how we, how uh, I think to your words, you kind of missed the target. I'm not sure whether you said those exact words, but that's your, your, your thrust. Uh, what, what in the matrix, in the metrics of the model of 2018 or the assumptions did we miss that drove the gap difference? And then have you used that learning as you designed your, your, um, your current GMS forecast? In other words, can we kind of learn from what we didn't get right in 2018 and, and uh, kind of built that into uh, the fix for this particular um, perspective? Yes. Uh through you, Mr. Warden, it's an excellent question. Um, it, the, the hardest thing to do in, in forecasting is to uh, pinpoint the exact time a sudden surge in growth occurs. And, um, you know, whenever you look at forecasts, you, you, you know, we tend to not try and sort of map out the peaks and troughs. It's, we try and sort of give a gradual curve. Uh, so we knew um, at the time of the 2018 GMS that things were going to turn around and, and there was going to be sort of a growth uptick. Uh, we did not have the benefit of all of the material coming out of the 2016 census. Um, so, you know, our, our, our sense of what was happening on the ground was, you know, not quite as clear as, um, as it is now. Um, and plus, as I say, um, you know, uh, what's been happening in the last three or four years um, at the fringe of the GGH uh, and the problems with housing affordability uh, that is pushing demand outside of the traditional housing markets, uh, we didn't, we did not expect. Um, and, um, you know, uh, so all of that informs, you know, uh, our, our assumptions right now. If I can, a follow up, Mr. Warren, just a quick one. Yeah, I, and, and the reason why I ask that question is there's a theory floating around these days that there's a, a vast but rather quick deurbanization occurring that has only been accelerated by COVID or accentuated, if you will, by COVID, maybe both. In fact, what we're seeing is what happened in the previous 100 years was an urbanization, people moving from the rural to the urban sector. But now, for a number of social and economic reasons, we're seeing that exit. But that exit is happening not over 100 years, but over 10 or shorter. And in fact, COVID, uh, I would argue, if you take a look at what's happened in our particular town alone, has shone a huge uh, uh, flashlight or, or spotlight on that. Uh, we've seen so, uh, temporary residents now become permanent residents and no indication that that trend is going to change. In other words, people have gotten comfortable working from home. People have gotten to use to the fact that you can actually live in the Blue Mountains or in Gray County 
and quote unquote work in Toronto. So I'm just wondering whether or not um, you're dialing some of that thinking into your modeling, uh, because I worry that even the projections you have here um, are going to be on the skinny side when we look back at this uh, four years from now, because of this rapid de and, and concentrated deurbanization that's happening. And there are quite a few people uh, from well-known uh, think tanks that are actually opining on this now and 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 it's and the impact it will have on infrastructure and counties like ours that that over a space of five years will have to deal with growth that we might, may not have normally have seen in 50 years okay. yes um sure you mr warden i mean it's an excellent point and i i think that there's two things here first of all um the answer um, to the question, you know, have we considered these changes in the forecasts um, is yes, we have. Um, but is, uh, are the numbers predicated on a fundamental reorientation of the pattern of settlement in Southern Ontario that is perhaps what you're describing, Councillor? I would say no. Um, because it's, we're still very uncertain as to what, whether the changes that have occurred since COVID are permanent or temporary. And I've read a lot of the, the opinions that, that you've read. Um, and there are, I, I think it's just fair to say right now is that there are many differences of opinion about this. And I would caution the county on um, predicating a, f a, a, an overly ambitious forecast um, on, you know, one, one set of opinions about this. And it takes something like work at home, for example. It's clear that this is, you know, everyone's been working from, at home and, uh, from one time or another over the last 18 months. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a strong um, debate right now as to whether offices should be um, having their people come in and, and work in the office again. Uh, remember that the work work at home is really only practical for one sector of the economy, um, those who work in offices. So if you work in a school or a hospital, uh, you're still going to have to go to your place of work. Um, and so, and, you know, there are a lot of offices in the GTA that I'm aware of that are, that have said, come September or whenever we're vaccinated, you're back in the office. You're being paid as uh, you're being paid a wage as if you're working in downtown Toronto, and we want you working downtown Toronto. We don't want you working from your cottage in Simcoe County or Gray County. So um, I think the approach will vary, um, and I think it's a little too early to tell how that will manifest itself. I think there are dangers to assuming too much right now, and although we're doing a 25-year forecast, um, I would encourage the county to update this work. Um, on a regular basis throughout that period to make sure that those trends as they play out are reflected in, in the changes that are made. Councillor Potter. Thank you, and that's an interesting answer. And, and I wondered uh, what, what, uh, what might you be looking for? What sort of data or information or trends might you be looking for uh, that would give us some idea of of what we're looking at. For example, I look at the fact that people are enrolling their children in school as an indication that they're at least thinking about staying here. Uh, but uh, we don't know that, of course. So I just wondered if there are things that, that you uh, would take as indicators at this point or whether we still need to wait and be a little more patient and see what what uh, indicators come down the line? Um, well, through you, Mr. Warden, I think, um, you know, one of the key indicators will be how quickly the um, development that has been approved for the next few years actually gets constructed. Uh, so, you know, we've had a lot of debate about the pace of development in Dundalk, for example. Um, and, um, you know, there's been a lot of um, uh, um, units approved and in theory, I'll, it, it could play out very, very quickly indeed. 
Um, but, you know, the demand for housing in Dundalk is very much tied to um, forces that are at play outside the county, uh, the availability of jobs, uh, you know, in Peel region, the ability of people to commute from Dundalk down to those jobs and how long it's going to take, uh, the affordability of those homes relative to the affordability of homes in the northern part of Peel region. And remember right now that Peel region is under, actually every municipality in the Greater Golden Horseshoe is undergoing a municipal comprehensive review under the provincial growth plan. Uh, and that is set to open up a whole swath of land for housing. Uh, so, you know, how that, and those are direct com competitors for, um, you know, developers in, in Dundalk and, and parts of Gray. So, you know, there's a, there, I, I, I think that the key, one of the key indicators then to your, to, to your question is, you know, to pay, pay, pay close attention to how the take up of units in the next few years is. Um, relative to those approvals. Thank you, Warden Hicks. And, and just to, to build off what uh, Stefan has said and, and to you know, outline some background to some of Councillor Potter and Councillor Sampson's questions, uh, the county is planning on, on updating this growth management strategy quite regularly. And in fact, the, the next scheduled update will be likely sometime in 2023 after we receive the full data sets from the 2021 census. And what we've noticed over time in, in looking back at the different growth management strategies is they are long-term forecasts, but, but they can also be shaped by, by current factors. And, and uh, the one thing I'd point out is, is we did a growth management strategy that was largely done in 2007 and passed in early 2008. Um, and at that point, uh, everything looked completely rosy and we were expecting high amounts of growth. And then, of course, in 2008, we had the, the global economic crisis. So by the time we got to our next growth management strategy in 2015, we had a bit of a contraction at that point because we hadn't really hit those targets that we thought we were going to hit uh, when we were forecasting in, in rosy times. And that's not to in any way diminish from uh, Stefan or, or his team at Hempson's work. Um, it's more or less to point out that that uh, county staff are aware that there are a lot of variable factors at play here, and, and we do see a lot of value in, in keeping this document relative, relatively current, even though, again, it is a long-term forecast. So um, we're going to mention this in the staff report later on, but we did just want to flag that we are planning on updating it here again in a few years' time. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other hands for now. No, sir. Okay. Councillor Robinson. Debating whether to ask the question or not, because I'm in, engrossed in the, in the study and presentation. So thank you for, for the latitude. I'm looking at the chart, which identifies allocation of population. And I, I'm just wondering if, if Stefan, if you wouldn't mind just um, um, perhaps providing us just with a little more of a drill down in terms of what we're seeing for the population forecast for our all of our member municipalities uh, up to uh, 2046, if you might. Thank you for your time. Yeah, um, through you, Mr. Warden. Um, <clears throat> well, I, 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 um, I haven't really prepared to speak to the individual um, uh, figures for each municipality. I mean, I can get into... Uh, um, uh, them if you like, and I have all my no notes next to me which I can dive into. But just in terms of the overall distribution, I think that, first of all, we recognize that um, uh, in the short term, uh, we have a pretty good idea of where the immediate um, um, construction activity is occurring, which development proposals have been uh, registered, uh, i.e. there's nothing stopping people from taking a permit out and building, um, and which have been draft approved, uh, um, i.e. you know, are probably within, you know, a two-year two, win two year window, a three-year window of being able to pull a permit. And when you look at all that stuff together, you see that about 50% of all the housing in that what I call the development pipeline, is in the town of the Blue Mountains. And so our expectation then is that, you know, the, the town of the Blue Mountains will, um, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, grab a lion's, the lion's share of growth in the short term. Um, as things play out a little bit later on, um, when we look at Southgate, uh, again, we, we've had a bit of a sort of a back and forth with, uh, with the staff at Southgate because it's not so much the, the, the potential for growth in Southgate. I think we all agree that Dundalk is a place that you know, could take off at any time. Uh, and certainly, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of active developers there and there are plans to expand services. It's really a question of how long that takes and whether there are sort of bumps in the road along, along the way. Um, but certainly when you look at over the long term, uh, there's lots of potential for growth in Southgate. And that's reflected here um, uh, in the table. Um, although, you know, we may be taking a little bit more of a conservative approach to how quickly that occurs than, than how some of the staff may, may feel about it. Um, um, Hanover, too, is a place where up until very recently uh, has been constrained by its own municipal boundaries. It is an, uh, an unusual municipality in Ontario in that, you know, when the amalgamations, municipal amalgamations of the 90s and the early parts of the 2000s took place, um, it, it was not amalgamated with a large rural area. Uh, so, you know, unlike Dundalk, which is in Southgate with a large rural area, Hanover is kind of like, um, you know, its own little town and does not have a sort of a rural hinterland. And as a result, it has, um, you know, the feeling is that there's a pent up demand for growth there that has been constrained by its land boundaries and some servicing constraints as well. And, and you know, um, environmental protection on, on certain lands. And so there's a lot of activity uh, that the town has undertaken to try and overcome those constraints. And um, we agree that there is a lot of potential for population growth in Hanover. Um, and we've worked very closely with them to, to try and map out how that might occur. And so there's a, a significant share uh, in Hanover as well. Elsewhere, you know, in the more sort of rural um, uh, and less urban places, I don't think you're gonna see too much uh, difference um, in the in the overall population growth we might see a a, a bit of an uptick in some places to reflect uh, that sort of early retiree uh, phenomenon that i was that i was describing earlier and the phenomenon of people converting their seasonal homes into into permanent residences and living in more sort of rural landscapes um, um, either as retirees or if they're going to be working um, it would have to be you know uh, a full a full work at home lifestyle or a lifestyle where uh, you're only going into um, a, a job in an urban area in the GTA, you know, once or twice a week. So I, I hope that addresses your question, Councillor, unless there was something more specific you wanted. I wonder if you could, I, and I appreciate the, the time spent on this uh, for certain, but I uh, wonder if you can also speak to uh, the other municipalities that, that you have uh, not mentioned as of yet within that allocation of population chart. Thank you. Yeah, so it's for you, Mr. Warden. I mean, Meaford and uh, Jordan Bluffs, those are, um, <clears throat> you know, those are municipalities that are less urbanized, but share features in common with the town of the Blue Mountains. Uh, so, uh, and, they're, and, and in that respect, quite different from the rest of the county. So, um, you know, that, that's where you get a lot of seasonal units, uh, a, lot of a lot of tourism, um, um, <clears throat> and, um, and so a lot of the population growth then associated with those places would be um, uh, arising from those kinds of activities. Um, and then, you know, West Gray, Gray Highlands, um, you know, we're not talking about very urban places there. Um, and so, you know, population growth would be fairly incremental um, without much opportunity for um, urban settlement areas to expand and accommodate, you know, significant amounts of population growth there. Um, and then I, I well, I, and, and then there's Owen Sound, of course. Um, and, you know, Owen Sound is tricky because, um, uh, you know, it is the central city of the county. Uh, 
Um, and as you saw from the previous slide, you know, it's a place that um, where population decline has been a feature of the landscape for many, many years. Um, we, we anticipate that uh, reversing. Um, and so as it functions as a central city, it will continue to attract, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> certain kinds of uh, um, population related employment, particularly centered on institutions and commercial activity um, that befits the central city. Um, we think there's, uh, and there certainly are a fair amount of development in the, in the pipeline there. Um, uh, apartment development proposals, quite significant apartment development proposals. And so we do see a reversal of the longstanding population decline in Owen Sound, notwithstanding it will, it will still remain a place where the population is older generally than the rest of the county. I think that's clear. Um, people, you know, older people, you know, want to be in a place where they can walk to, to grab their groceries. They want to be close to a hospital, um, and that sort of thing. So, um, but uh, at the same time, overall growth in the county um, and the kind of sort of things that are fueling growth, migration from uh, older adults uh, as well as from younger families, that will translate into, we anticipate, small population increase in, in Owen Sound. Thank you. Are we good, Councillor Robinson? Thank you very much for that explanation. Most appreciate it. Okay, Councillor Ponder. Thank you for indulging me for one more question, uh, Mr. Warden. Uh, because when I, I look at the allocation of population chart that's on the screen now, uh, and it says the population for the Blue Mountains will be about 16,000 by 2046, we would argue that we've already surpassed that. We have over 8,000 households, and we don't all live alone. So, uh, you know, when everybody's here, and when we look at the services that we're providing and that the county's providing, uh, we're already surpassing that 16,000 population. So uh, I'm not sure what the situation would be for the rest of the county, for the other municipalities. I wouldn't be surprised if it was, uh, if not the same in, in scope, at least the same in, uh, in the, uh, in the fact that it's happening. So, and it's, it's not that I want to question, but I think we have to take this in the uh, perspective that whatever is here uh, for us, that number may be double easily uh, by 2046, what we see there. We may be more in the 32,000 population range in terms of the population we're serving because the part-time residents still need garbage service, they still need roads, they still need all the services of full-time residents. Uh, and we, uh, we have that same responsibility and so does the county. Uh, so I think that's something we have to bear in mind that the numbers we're seeing here are, are great information, but there may be more, more to it behind the scenes that we need to delve in a little farther. And, and I'm sure that's true for all the municipalities. Councilor Potter, you're saying there may be more to the story. Stefan? Uh, yes, Mr. Warden, and, and there is more to the story. I mean, this, this population that's shown here is the, is the population that's recorded in the census. That is people who are saying, I live full time in the town of the Blue Mountains and, and filling out the census accordingly. Um, so the seasonal population, like the seasonal units, is a separate part of the forecast. It's not reflected in these figures at all. Okay. Um, Scott. Thank you, Mr. Warden. If, if this is wrapping up uh, discussion, I did just want to thank uh, Stefan and the team at Hempson on behalf of uh, county staff. They've been excellent to work with on this project and they've been very receptive to our constant questions and, and the, the great feedback we got from uh, member municipal staff and, and consultants in that regard. So just in this public forum, I'd like to offer our thanks and gratitude in this regard. Very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you. Great information. <clears throat> Good discussion. Okay, we're moving on now to item, <coughs> excuse me, item 6B. Uh, that puts uh, Kim on deck. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Everybody hear me okay? Oh, yeah, just so do let me. me. Let me just uh, yeah. 
um, get it uh, on the floor first. Do the things. Do that, <laughs> We're dealing yeah. with the solid waste management feasibility study. Sorry for that pause. That threw you off. Uh, it is moved by Councillor Burley and seconded by Councillor Keaveny. Kim, okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. All right, everyone. Um, just a little bit of a catch up here. Last February, um, council provided direction to staff to pursue funding from the municipal modernization program um, in support of undertaking a feasibility study with regard to a role for the county in um, some or all aspects of solid waste management. Um, we received a response from uh, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs on June 30th, and I think you were all copied on that correspondence, that we'd been uh, approved for the maximum available grant of $150,000. So it was great to see that financial support. However, the timeline associated with the grant is very concerning. Um, the province in their correspondence had suggested that they'd like to see the report wrapped up by November 30th. So last week I had a discussion with all of the CAOs from our member municipalities. Uh, they were unanimous in their belief that the deadline needs to be extended in order for this project to be successful. I also did check with um, one of our consulting firms that has uh, quite an extensive knowledge of solid waste management operations in the county. Uh, and they agreed that even a six month window would really require all hands on deck. Um, I spoke to the province and asked for um, an extension to uh, March of 2022. They offered me January and uh, I, I, I countered with the February 18th that you see um, here, thinking that um, with March being their year end, I was trying to find a date that, that might satisfy them. I have not heard back yet from, from the province about whether or not they will accept um, the February 18th deadline. So, uh, you know, are really the questions that we need to focus on today are really about the scope of the project and the, and the timeline that uh, we would be trying to meet. I really wanted to emphasize how important um, the engagement of your staff is in our ability to be successful with this study. Um, you can see here that one of the recommendations is that staff be directed to strike a project steering committee with membership from each municipality, um, that we work through a draft RFP process and then bring that back. So I think this, again, would need to be a very iterative process. Um, until I have RFP results, I don't know about A, how many consultants will be able to secure at this time, given how busy everybody is, or whether or not the grant funds will be sufficient to carry out the project, uh, or whether the county will need to provide um, additional resources uh, to complete this task. Uh, but that's a decision that we could make further on down the road after we've actually let an RFP. So what I was asking for you today in the resolution was, um, are you okay to go ahead if we can get the extension to February 18th, 2022? Are you prepared to support your staff um, participating on a steering committee and putting in the really the extensive amount of time that it will require, right? Um, the county is more than happy to do the procurement and to facilitate all of the discussions, provide oversight to the consultant. But at the end of the day, the information that the consultant needs to be able to complete this project successfully is information that resides with your individual municipalities. I don't have that. So our consultants will have to engage with your staff extensively um, in an information gathering and analysis exercise. Um, if we're not successful in having the project extended to uh, February of 2022, then I think we're at another decision point. Do you want to see this put into the 2022 budget for consideration at a future time? Um, 
that's what I'm suggesting here. You may have other suggestions. I'm happy to answer any questions. The uh, scope of the of the project, what it would entail, is what we discussed a lot when when we talked about this in February. And you can see at the beginning of my report, there's a paragraph there about the objectives of the third party review and the expected outcomes of the third party review. That's the material that was provided to the province. So this, those objectives of um, undertaking an assessment in comparison of solid waste management services and um, making a determination on whether there's a role for gray in solid waste management service delivery, any cost savings or operational improvements. That's the basis on which the province provided the grant funding. So that's what we would need to provide back to them if we were to move forward. Happy to discuss anything you might want to talk about. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, are there any questions, Council? I am not seeing, oh, I see Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Warden, and uh, thanks, Kim, for the report. I, I mean, I think getting information is always important, but I am concerned about what the total amount of this uh, project may be and, uh, you know, what the off-ramps are going to be. Uh, my understanding is we would require a triple majority if we're going to go down this path, and I'm just wondering when that decision would be made and how much money we spend prior to getting to that point. Well, I, it would be um, my belief that the feasibility study, which would include um, some sort of public engagement process, would at least inform a discussion at County Council. I think after that, you'd have to assess what the findings and recommendations were out of the study to then determine whether or not you wanted to take it any further than that. At this stage, there we're not. We don't. I don't believe we have any information on which to say anything about what we might do in the future. Anything further, Scott? No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sampson. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Uh, through you, uh, I'm just wondering whether, in looking at the scope of work, we should also. Um, add in an assessment of the liabilities associated with the operations of waste management, uh, whether those are liabilities are financial or, or, or otherwise. Um, I, I know there's an assessment here of the current value of the assets each municipality has, but I'd like to understand, I think uh, the council should understand the liabilities association associated with those assets, because um, sometimes they are current and sometimes they are future Sometimes they're recorded very well and sometimes they're not. Uh, some might be future and some might actually be historical. There's liabilities associated with leachate management, for instance, that's mm -hmm. historical and future and current that need to be considered. And I think council needs to have a full understanding of not only the assets, but the liabilities that come with these assets. Um, and secondly, um, there's a reference here to maximizing existing disposal capacity and I, I think council should also, when it makes a decision, understand where the site will be for additional capacity and that discussion needs to be had at the time the decision is made as well. Because I think to assume that the existing capacity in ground, if you will, in the county is sufficient for our future demands might be, um, well, it might be misleading council uh, for make that decision without knowing where new capacity was going to be installed and who was going to be the host municipality for that new capacity. So um, I, I would like to add that to the scope of work uh, and suggest that uh, that be added so that information coming to council that, that would encourage a decision around these off ramps was, was complete and fulsome. Thank through you, Madam. through you, sorry. Mr. Warden. Quick yes. Second, um, if I might. Um, I'm sorry. Oh. Just one quick second, if I might. Yeah. Um, I, I'll let you go in a sec, but uh, Madam Clerk, are these issues of liability and capacity, in your view, uh, representative of an amendment to what we have before us or not? Or can they simply be you know, taken into consideration? I think um, the CAO will probably address that, but um, what we're looking for now is just approval to, to uh, uh, 
strike a steering committee um, with the approval of the province to extend that. And those things could be included with the staff uh, steering committee and uh, the RFP, but certainly Kim can commit, can uh, step in if I'm incorrect there. Sorry, Kim. Thanks, Thanks Heather. And um, so a couple of things, first of all, um, Clause three in the recommendation um, is asking that we report back to council with the draft RFP. So before it goes out, you mm -hmm. would have another opportunity to um, verify that the scope of work was um, correct. Um, with regard to um, liabilities, part of I th what was meant by in the scope of work, the second bullet consideration of um, regulatory, environmental, economic, and social factors was casting a pretty wide net there uh, around things that certainly would touch on liability, but that's something that we can be explicit about too, just to make sure that they know that they want a separate um, a separate discussion just around the liability question. As far as future, um, the requirements for future landfills and where they might be, my recommendation would be that this report was meant, this is a feasibility study to really understand where we are right now and what opportunities might be present. I think getting into the discussion, if my if my experience and memories of Simcoe County have taught me anything, future landfill capacity is a whole question unto itself and might best be uh, dealt with as a standalone item after we had had an initial conversation about um, how imminent that was and what opportunities we had um, before us. But again, I counsel is more than welcome to uh, direct me as they so choose. Thank you for that, Kim. I should have just shut my mouth and let you speak. <laughs> it's okay. I don't see any other hands, Madam Clerk. So if, no, that sir. Is, if that is the case, then is it time for us to put the question on the motion to receive and to enter into the funding agreement and to strike that steering committee and uh, the direction around if we don't uh, get the extension moving it to, to 2022 budget. Uh, so calling the question, is there anyone opposed? No one being opposed, I'm going to say that that is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're moving on. The 6C. We're dealing with the uh, Employment Services Ontario Transformation. Um, I believe that, oh, Elizabeth is on deck. And this is moved by Councillor Desai and seconded by Councillor, well, uh, instead of Milne, we need a, a new seconder. Uh, I see Councillor Hutchison. So Elizabeth, you now have the floor. Thank you, through you, Chair. This is um, a report for information only to um, update everyone on what is happening with the provincial transformation of employment services under Ontario Works. And uh, they have opened the request for qualifications, asking those interested parties who may wish to be the, the service system manager for a larger geographic area than our own county um, to submit qualifying information. So it is not a commitment to take on any additional work. It is simply to um, express interest and to qualify as a potential um, social uh, service system manager and to go to part two, which would be the actual RFP phase. The, uh, the social services staff here and in three other areas have joined together to form a consortium of sorts to provide the qualifying information to see if we could be qualified to be the lead for that area and if the province would consider us to do it. Okay, questions? I do not see any hands. You must have done a terrific job, Elizabeth. Thank you. Everyone understands what we're voting on. <clears throat> Uh, then I'll call the question. Is there anyone opposed to the motion before you? I see no hands, therefore it's carried. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Okay, we're on item 6D, <clears throat> dealing with the growth management uh, strategy. We've had lots of information on this uh, already. I believe that Scott is on deck for this. It's moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Keevan. Scott? 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Warden and, and members of, uh, of Council. I will keep this brief since we've already had a, a good discussion and a lengthy presentation on it. I think uh, the key takeaway from, from what Stefan had shared with us is, is the county is growing and we are growing all across the county at, at a more rapid pace than previously, previously predicted. And, and this speaks to the need for, for long-term planning at both the county and municipal level uh, to make sure that we have our services and infrastructure in place uh, to accommodate this growth. And, and uh, certainly the county staff, if, if uh, uh, committee supports the report today are looking forward to uh, starting to address this through an official plan amendment. Uh, just before I, I wrap up here, I did just want to address a few of the comments that were raised by county councillors um, during some of the, the great questions to Stefan in this regard. Um, I, I believe it was Councillor Keebney that, that uh, raised concerns and issues about the labour pool. And, and uh, as, as staff, we, we fully agree with you in that regard. And, and although it might not be something we can address through this growth management strategy, it's not something that the county uh, is silent on. And we've, we've been working quite closely um, with our partners in economic development, both at the county level and, and through various uh, municipalities and agencies, uh, to try to look at um, um, at what we can do to to help uh, uh, help fill the gap in in the labor pool in that regard, because we know as our population ages, um, it only seems to be to be getting worse in this regard. Um, and so, although it's not something that was explicitly addressed in the growth management strategy, we did want you to know that that it is something that staff are working on, and and through some of the the uh, partnerships that they built and, and Sydenham campus and, and the, the, uh, the local immigration partnership, uh, there are actions being taken in that regard to, to try to address some of those issues. Um, with respect to some of Councillor Sampson's uh, questions about the, uh, the uh, definition of rental um, and whether or not the numbers shown in the, in the Hempson study were reflecting uh, what was on the ground uh, from, a, from a rental availability availability perspective, sorry. Also some very great comments. And it's something that, again, although it's not explicitly addressed in the growth management strategy, it's something that, again, county staff are working with, with municipal staff on, on addressing. And there's a number of initiatives underway, including things like um, waiver of development charges for rental units and the community improvement programs uh, and other incentives um, that are looking at trying to start to address that need. And I'm pleased to say that in, in recent years, we have seen more interest um, than ever before in new rental units. And, and there was actually a report that uh, Randy and I took to the Affordable Housing Task Force earlier this week uh, that spoke to some interviews we did with, with uh, rental housing developers and rental housing landlords in that regard. Um, and although there were some challenges across the county, no doubt, uh, they did give a, a favorable outlook for developing new rental units um, across the county uh, moving into the into the future. So again, I did want to let council know um, that we are looking into some of these issues. With respect to the next steps on the growth management strategy itself, again, if, if um, council receives the report, uh, staff's intention would be to share that, of course, with, with member municipal staff, um, but also to share that with other public and private agencies, uh, which may have use for this data. Uh, and certainly, um, and it was brought up in, in some of the council comments, uh, the school boards would, would be key partners in that regard. Um, so if, if the county has done work and invested public dollars to say that we're growing, um, then everybody who would have an interest in, in that information and that data should be able to benefit from it and, and, and not have to pay for their own studies in that regard. Um, as I said, we are looking at the official plan amendment, and that official plan amendment would update the numbers, the growth projections in our in our county official plan. It would extend the planning horizon out to 25 years, uh, and then we'd also be looking at uh, a few minor housekeeping changes, just little things that we flagged uh, as we've started to work with the plan for a few years now. Um, so I won't uh, I won't belabor this point, um, but I will um, will be happy to take any questions if there are any further questions from council. Thank you, Scott, Councillor Potter. Thank you. And, and Scott, uh, for us, this leaves us in a bit of a conundrum because this report, as far as it goes, is fine, but it's not telling the whole story for us and maybe for other municipalities in, in gray uh, in that it's not, it's not addressing the issues. When we go to the province and the federal government and say that we have, we're dealing with with so much growth, they don't normally understand what we're talking about and because they don't see the seasonal numbers. So without the seasonal numbers being part of the overall picture and, and them being sort of off to the side somewhere, 
they don't really tell the story for us. And, and I suspect that there are other municipalities, I won't speak for anybody else, but I suspect there are other municipalities in gray and the county as a whole that, that need to be able to show, show more clearly uh, that what's really going on here is a lot more, uh, a lot more growth and shows up in full time. So uh, that, that poses a real problem, I think, uh, for us and our ratepayers when, when we're trying to provide services uh, and, and not really being recognized for what we are truly trying to provide. Tom? Sure, through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, thank you for those comments, Councillor Potter. I do think they're important, and and uh, certainly Blue Mountains and a few other other communities, as you've noted, in Gray would be experiencing that. I think what will be important to look at going forward in 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 trying to interpret and and use the results from the study is, as you've pointed out, to to look at both the the permanent population forecast, and as Stefan said, that's that's you know what people report in the census, as well as those seasonal forecasts. And right now, the way the growth management strategy has, has laid those out is, is they are two separate tables. And, and right now, they are two separate tables in the county official plan as well. So, so really, to get that full picture, as, as, as you've kind of pointed at, you, you need to really add A plus B, the permanent plus the seasonal, to show the total growth picture. Um, even there, I think from a, a housing perspective, it, it, it doesn't necessarily capture sort of all the, the day trippers that we know are coming to Gray County and, and coming to, to Blue Mountains and other areas in particular, but hopefully some of that can be picked up through, through, through the rises we see in employment growth. So it's certainly something we as staff can look at going forward and uh, whether or not it's, it's worth um, trying to better paint the picture uh, between those two tables, the seasonal and the permanent, and, and outlining both in the official plan and in the data that uh, that they need to be considered as a whole and, and not independent of one another. Thank you, Scott. Randy, you have something to add? Yeah, just further to what Scott's uh, indicating, I think we've had some preliminary discussions with uh, some of those municipalities that definitely see more seasonal uh, seasonal growth, seasonal residents, and, and uh, for sure with town staff. Um, and it's, it's like Scott said, it's, it's trying to combine the two and how we treat it through policy so that from a servicing and infrastructure perspective, we're getting that fuller picture. So it's treating what we're talking about is like treating a, a unit as a unit, whether it's a permanent unit or a seasonal unit, uh, the, they have similar demands on, on our services and infrastructure as, as a whole, as a collective, um, when I'm speaking with county and local municipalities. So that's something that we can look at working with our municipal staff uh, to address through through policy uh, when we bring forward the, the housekeeping amendment for sure. All right, I think the issue raised by Councillor Potter is legitimate because what I hear him saying is that uh, there's a full story to be told and uh, the numbers as they're currently sitting don't fully tell uh, that story. We know, uh, I mean, he, when he hit me with the, the numbers around just units we have eight thousand units and we know that there's you know more than two so we may already be there that's that's a legitimate point but i also hear you randy in saying uh that uh, the challenge is how uh, you position that and how you get those uh, uh those figures in to, to tell the true story councillor sampson yes thank you mr ward so not surprisingly i, su I support what uh, councillor potter is saying because i worry that that looking at the data the way it's presented a number of years ago got us and probably Collingwood in the hot water where Collingwood's in deeper hot water than we are around some infrastructure supports because what has come up as we've now heard from Collingwood is that they're short water capacity um, and they don't have the units for the growth that, that's being planned. Those decisions were made a number of years ago, and I worry based upon data similar to what we're looking at now. I don't want to fall in the same trap. I think I, you know, I asked the question, did we basically learn from our previous mistakes? And I, I'm not sure I got a good answer back on that, frankly. Um, I worry that we haven't. And, and, and as it relates to not just the Blue Mountains, but other parts of the county, but it impacts the county because county infrastructure services our area. I worry that we have lost in another chart somewhere this 
half of the population of our town that pays taxes and, you know, turns on the water and flushes the toilet when they come here every weekend. And that infrastructure needs to be there. And I guess the risk, the risk to us as a county of overestimating growth is that at least we have the infrastructure and the ground for growth. The risk on the other side, in my view, is disastrous. You have growth that's an infrastructure that's significantly trailing growth and you don't have the cash to pay for it. And, and I would rather err on being small C conservative, if you will, or maybe big C conservative, I don't know, on the growth number, uh, than on the other side. Because Collingwood on water, I think, and we perhaps in our Thornberry issues are facing capacity limits because I think we use data that was wrong or misleading, or if it was there, we, it was on a, another chart and another page of the document. I think it needs to be quite clearly up front. We have, you know, half of our population, non-permanent residents, and frankly, if you believe the numbers on the tourism side, 3 million people coming to this area every year to enjoy it for a week or a day. They turn the water on and they flush their toilets too. <laughs> And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a demand on infrastructure that we had better start to invest in now, not, to, not when it's too late. Because when it's too late, you scared that tourism away and, and that has a serious negative impact on a lot of our businesses, which are tourism related. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit worried that this report is not telling the whole story and it needs to. Uh, legitimate points, Councillor Sampson, uh, Scott, or Randy, anything you want to add to that? It's, it's, thank you, Mr. Warden, through you. Um, very great points, and, and it is something that we can look further into, and as Randy said, we can explore both at a policy level, but also working with municipal staff who are, who are seeing some of these effects on, on the ground floor. Uh, the one other thing I'd point out is um, these growth forecasts aren't just used in our official plan, and as, as, as Councillor Sampson was alluding to, uh, they are used uh, in, in other avenues as well. And, and one of the um, you know, most imminent avenues that we're looking at using this in would be to inform our, our um, uh, development charges background study that, that uh, Hempson is, is working on right now. And in, in past discussions with Hempson, you know, they've always uh, cautioned us about, about not being too optimistic um, because if, if we count on collecting money based on those building permits and then the money doesn't come in, then, then we don't have the money for, for paying for those services. But I certainly take Councillor Sampson's point. Uh, we don't want to go too far the other way either. So I think it's, it's the, the point has been taken by staff and it's something that I think we'd like to have further discussions with municipal staff on and, and exploring at, at the policy stage, both at our own county official plan review uh, but also uh, in working with municipalities on, on their official plans as well. Thank you. I think that's it for hands, isn't it? If that's the case, maybe it's time to call the question. So on the motion, we're receiving the uh, growth management, sorry, the addendum and the uh, Hampson uh, uh, report. Uh, we're gonna share it with the other municipalities and we're gonna direct staff to prepare uh, county official plan amendment. Mr. Uh, Ward, can I have a recorded vote on this, please? Sure. Madam Clerk. Thank you. Um, I will note that Councillor O'Leary has left the meeting as well, Mr. Warden. Okay. Okay. So we're voting on the addendum to PDR CW 2820, the updated growth management study. Councillor Mackey. In favor? Councillor Gamble. In favor. Councillor Burley. In favor. Councillor Carlton. In favor. Councillor McQueen. In favor. Councillor Desai. In favor. Councillor Patterson. In favor. Warden Hicks. Yay. Councillor Clumpus. In favor. Councillor Keaveny. In favor. Councillor Body is not here. Councillor O'Leary is not here. Councillor Woodbury and Millen have left. Councillor Sampson. No. Councillor Potter. Opposed. Councillor Robinson. In favor. 
Councilor Hutchinson. Yeah, in favor. Thank you. Motion is carried 55 to 13. Thank you very much. Clerk, we'll move on with the agenda. Mr. Warden. Yes. Just to follow up to that. Um, we know we did a lot of the stats, stats can whatever was done this year. Um, I guess through the planning staff and or the CAO subsequent to this coming out today, um, it will be interesting to what data comes from back snapshot during COVID. Um, I guess the question is, when will some of that data come trickling back from this year? And, and will we be able to do a sort of a, uh, an overview of this report from that data? I know it, that data sometimes comes in little pieces at a time, so it's sort of hard and we're working on old data even as of today, but any, any discussion around that when we start to see some trickling out of, of that data? Well, Deputy Warden, we've seen this story before. Randy? <laughs> through, through you, Mr. Warden. Um, so we start seeing some of the data, like some of the higher level population data uh, coming out usually about a year after the census, but we really don't get the full data, the full detailed results until usually two years after the census. And so with that, we've actually planned to do uh, a, a, another update starting in 2023 and maybe towards mid or later in 2023 when we actually get all the full data sets. Um, but that's that's the plan is to, to time it on a go forward basis, at least uh, updating the growth management studies in, in, in alignment with the census period two years after this each census period, because uh, that's when we usually see the full data results from the census. So. At the same time, we also will work with our local municipalities to continue to monitor what's happening on the ground uh, through building permit information and other information because, you know, through what Councilor Sampson indicated earlier, um, you know, we need to make sure that uh, we have the services and the infrastructure in place to be able to respond to this growth. Um, so, so we have to continue to monitor this as, as we go forward. And we'll be working with our local municipal staff, continue to monitor that as, as we move forward. Just to follow that, Mr. Warden. Go ahead. I, I think it will be interesting to see what kind of stats do come out of that because, you know, it's uh, it's it, it, it's it's just a different snapshot in time of what we have gone through and and we have seen the experiences of real estate and what's gone on in in Gray Bruce and, you know, just uh, just from what we see from real estate prices. The other part I want to raise is. Um, Certainly, it's so important to follow what's happening in each municipality. Again, as you, you do, because a lot of the subdivision approvals come through the county is, is that part. So you are tracking that, that part. But those trends, the only other thing is that, you know, we've sort of lost a little bit of conversation around is still that aging baby boomer and where that is moving along, right? Because we know that that's just getting into that part of, of that cohort that's... Um, that's moving forward. And, uh, you know, I, I have used that, that uh, re uh, uh, resemblance to or that uh, re re uh, reference to the, the you know, the uh, David Foote, uh, the uh, Boom Bust and Echo book that's, but it's moved forward in 20 years later, right? But that's where we're at. And a lot of that is through demographics and, and that's it. So it is interesting that we do have to keep that in the back of our mind because uh, part of Gray, Gray Highlands is south of the Blue Mountains, but there are similar to what the representatives of Blue Mountains are saying is I've seen trends where those weekend places have become more permanent resident places and, and more specifically with the COVID. And I think it will be interesting as, as uh, oop, I'm almost out of power here, as the, uh, the speaker today said how, you know, the next six months will be, will be a real determination of, of what is that order of where you're working from moving forward once we come out of that. So that's going to be an interesting next six months as well. So anyway, all good information, very good information. You know, it helps us move forward and uh, all we can do is get the best data we can. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Um, I'm moving things along now. We're on to item number seven. Is there any other business? Seeing none. Uh, item number eight, any notices of motion? Seeing none, we will move to the last item. And seeing some of the faces, people are probably happy about this item. <laughs> um, so adjournment is moved by Councillor Burley and seconded by Councillor, well, we need to find a, a seconder, uh, Councillor Desai. 
uh, that we adjourn. I'm assuming no one is opposed to that. I want to thank everyone. That's carried, by the way. I want to thank everybody. It was, uh, I, I don't know, it was a very engaging uh, meeting. We covered a lot, of, a lot of ground today. So thank you for that. A bit of a, a marathon there, but it was a very good meeting in my view. Mr. Warden. Day. Yeah. Mr. Warden, will we get an update? I guess we, our next meeting, we'll get an update with our AMO, our AMO delegations as well. Yes. And uh, Kim, do you want to speak to AMO delegations? Just briefly. Okay, certain, certainly. So, um, so just this afternoon, I while we were in this meeting, I heard for from the Ministry of Health with regard to community paramedicine. Um, yesterday, we confirmed um, Ministry of Long Term Care about the status of our redevelopment projects and the Long Term Care Commission reports. Um, we also so that. Most of these are on the 16th, on the Monday. Yeah. Um, municipal affairs about affordable housing in coordination with the Ministry of Health for supportive housing is on Tuesday, the 17th. And um, Attorney General regarding virtual court and our hybrid process is also on the Monday. So we've, we've had um, confirmation of all of the uh, delegation mm -hmm. requests that we made. Thank you, Mr. Ward, and thank you, Madam CEO. All right. We're done. Thank you all. Have a good day and good weekend. It's a PPS, a business after adjournment. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, folks. Thank you. Okay.